right. So I would I would give it a 70% chance we are live. So Richard, <laughs> thanks for coming on. Appreciate you taking the time yeah. to have a conversation with me. Would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself before we get started? Yeah, hi, I'm Richard Brown. Uh, I think this is the fifth time I've talked to you on your channel, possibly. So um, my day job is teaching philosophy at the City University of New York, and my uh, spare time includes hanging out online and uh, talking about more philosophy. <laughs> I thought you were a professional skateboarder. Oh, professional. No, no, amateur skateboarder. Absolutely. Amateur skateboarder, professional philosopher. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah, I've been skateboarding for three more? years now after a, uh, you know, 30 year break or so. <laughs> gotcha. Which one pays more? About the same. Which one pays more? Well, in terms of self-confidence and overall feeling of like uh, accomplishment, I'd say skateboarding. <laughs> but in terms of paying the bills, uh, philosophy. <laughs> but I definitely feel, you know, philosophy is difficult and um, I'm not the most smart person, but uh, at least skateboarding, I can set goals and try to achieve them. I'll never be a great skateboarder. I know that for sure, but uh, I'll be an adequate skateboarder. <laughs> cool. Cool. All right. So we're going to talk about the rule following argument. Could you give us an overview of the rule following argument specifically? What are the implications of the argument? Like supposedly it means that meaning isn't what, how we think of it or something. And what exactly does that mean? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, we've talked about this before, so this is like a, a follow up on that, but, um, <clears throat> uh, Oh yeah, this is live. I mean, you guys can tell by the by the hair, right? Uh, so, can, well, can you edit your hair in post production if it wasn't live? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that'd be very good. So, you know, uh, um, first, I was going to ask you if you've changed your mind on any of this stuff, or um, are we sort of starting from where we left off? Probably the same. I think I don't think i've changed much i think that the position is essentially i don't see the problems with the rule of following it, what it's supposed to state any any way that's different than like the matrix i think last time i used the analogy of the matrix argument that like we could be in the matrix and so everything's wrong or whatever and i don't see the rule of following argument as anything different uh fundamentally it seems like if we were in the matrix, then everything we thought we were doing five seconds ago could be totally wrong. Or the the evolutionary argument from Plantinga, where we were on a lily pad or frog on a leaf, um, doing one thing, what we think we're doing something else. Seems like an analogous argument to these two things. And I don't see the fundamental difference or what implications it has. Okay. So the uh, my, my goal is not to convince you to be a meaning skeptic. I, I don't think anyone really is a meaning skeptic. My, my goal is simply to <clears throat> talk about the argument so that you understand it, and then you can say what your view is. Because I felt like last time, even after uh, we talked and we emailed a bit, you were saying you don't really quite see what the relevance or force of the argument is supposed to be. So that's mostly what I'm concerned about. And also just to set a couple of ground rules, you know, we're not looking for a, a, a tea jumpster fire today. <laughs> No, no jumpster fires. Uh, looking for a civilized conversation, um, which I, I admit last time was my fault mostly that it wasn't. But uh, you know, we're trying harder to be nice. So the the basic argument <clears throat> is very simple. Uh, you take any predicate that you like, any function that you like, and you think of an alternative meaning for that function. So, for example, um, with addition, it's quaddition. But with any other predicate, you could do the same thing. So you could take blue and turn it into grew. Uh, are you familiar with grew? Yes. Okay, so grew and blue have as their similarity that they overlap um, within a certain context. So something is grew, let's say, if it's green up until the year 2024 or blue afterwards. Um, so <clears throat> the quite, and that can be done for any, any, uh, word at all. So if you want to take the word intention, you can invent the smin tension, where to smin tend is to intend as you normally would up until uh, Tuesday um, or whatever day today is, I forget, uh, up until Sunday. And then um, except on Mondays, it would be doing the opposite. So you can always make any kind of gerrymandered predicate that you want defined in these arbitrary ways using disjunction. So that's uh, 
you know, it's fairly weak. Um, so that I did have focusing a on real quick on oh, this yeah. part. So, uh -huh. um, why, what is the significance of using some period of time T and then after TX? Why not just say the word means something completely different, like the evolutionary argument where we, we think we're, I don't know, running and we're really on a lily pad on a frog or something. Why, why is there any relevance to this time part and just make it, instead of making it just a completely different meaning altogether? Because we want it to be true now. So the, the group predicate is uh, if you if you take something, um, so this this thing right here is not GRU. Um, it's it's blue, but uh, maybe tomorrow will be GRU. Um, so the green things are the things uh, which you would identify as green. The GRU things are the green things up until a specific date or blue after that date. So the the kind of idea of sectioning it is to make sure that there's some way we could say that there's a, a, um, a an accurate or correct part. And then the um, inaccurate or incorrect part uh, comes at a later time. Well, so I still don't see why we couldn't just say like the statement, I am holding a phone. Either that statement is true now or we're in the matrix. This is false. And the the separation between the two st statements and their truth and falsity seems to be in a sense the same because like either way one of the statements is true and one of the statements is false just like this this object is either truly green or truly grew um yeah i mean i guess in that way i it's fine but i, I would disagree with whether it's true or not that there's a phone in the matrix but I, I think maybe we could talk about that later if you want to but i think it would be true in the matrix that there is a phone um, so, so, so basic, any way you want to define these things, I, I take your point, any way you want to define these things. Um, uh, the question is, how do you know which one that you meant at a certain time? And the traditional argument always begins by considering your past history. So, you know, in the past, you were thinking you were adding, um, the skeptic comes in the past, you weren't doing quadition or quadding. Um, and you ask, what is quadition? They say, well, it's all the normal stuff up, up to a certain number. And then uh, after that, five. Um, so take any sort of numbers that you're not used to adding. So up until that number, it's the regular sort of function of addition, or it returns the value of five after that. Uh, so the question is, what fact about you could make it the case that you meant addition as opposed to quadition or that you meant blue as opposed to grew or that you meant any of these things that you standardly took yourself to mean as opposed to these non-standard um gerrymandered kinds of things that's the so my first puzzle. intuition my first intuition is well that's that simple is look into your brain your brain either your brain or reality is going to physically determine what you meant because meaning uh, as I understand it, is whatever is determining you to do the action in the first place. So if I meant to do rule one, what that means is that there's something in my brain, rule one is in my neurology or it is in the laws of physics, and it is causing me to do that rule. And therefore, I couldn't be doing the other rule because the rule that I'm doing is determined by either my brain or physics. And so we can know to answer the question, uh, what is it about me that determines rule one over rule two? Well, there's something biologically or physically that solves the problem. There's no problem. Mm -hmm. That's what that's so how, how would the rule uh, determine it? In, well, so in like rule say, one sense of written down. Well, so let's I'll, I'll go with rule two just because it's easier to understand. Say I'm say I'm doing the 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 rule that after after number fifty two everything is five or something. Um, if I'm following that rule and I've still only gotten to like thirty or whatever, there's some part in my brain that once I hit fifty five, or some part in physics that once I hit fifty five, the next number will be five, and that has to be written as like a coding program somewhere in my brain. Um, that I know about either through society, society has taught this to me that after I get 50, 52, I go to five or that somehow in the laws of physics, it determines that after every computer gets up to that number, it just happens to go to five. And that's just the law of the universe or something. And so it's determined and it's built into either my brain knowingly or unknowingly that it will occur. And that this part of the rule has to be baked into 
uh, either my brain or physics in order for me to be following that rule. Okay. So the, the first thing is that I, I think when I hear you say that, it sounds to me like you're saying maybe two different things. Um, so, so on the one hand, so, well, traditionally we wanted to uh, distinguish between what they call skeptical solutions and so-called straight solutions, non-skeptical ones. So non-skeptical solutions try to actually find some meaning constituting fact, some thing which would make it the case that you meant one one versus the other, which is sort of what Kripke proposed in the original uh, Kripkenstein book, um, always look for a kind of skeptical solution, <clears throat> which is to say, yeah, okay, so it's got to be something about the community, uh, something about the context that you're in. It's merely that you're raised in a certain environment where they, you were taught to go on in this way or something like that. <clears throat> but there's no fact of the matter about you independent of the context or the community which would um which would make a case so in other words this is kind of you know like hume skeptical solution to the problem of induction or something like that it's supposed to be uh um kind of admitting that there's no objective thing and appealing to these contextual things so part of what you said sounds like you're doing that as well and in fact when i first heard you talk about this with uh whoever jack angstrich or somebody i forget way back when that's what it sounded like to me as well back then that's what started this whole thing was that's why i wanted to talk to you about this because it sounded like what you were saying was look you have the cd the cd can be you know player and red um that's like the context but absent the uh the 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 computer which can read out the cd you can't really answer the question just by looking at the cd itself and that in a way to me admits that uh, there's a there's a challenge here and that you can only get the skeptical solution so I wasn't sure which one of those you really were meaning, whether you were trying to go for like a, a so-called non-skeptical solution or whether you are okay with this more skeptical kind of uh, take. That is the context. Um, I guess I would try to translate that into more like um, the brain analogy. So the, the programming on the disc is going to be determined by the society. So it's arbitrary, but what the disc is trying to accomplish wouldn't be arbitrary at that point it would be like given my societal programming when i press when i do this thing i'm expecting this result and that's in the program that's in the cd the cd is expecting a result it's programmed for windows or whatever and so if i program the cd for windows it's it's physically determined that i'm expecting this result and so i can similarly look at my brain or look at my uh the laws of physics or whatever and say um I'm following this pattern because I've been programmed with this pattern with this expected result. And therefore that answers the question. This is the, this is the rule I'm following. And so I wouldn't see a difference there. So I see like the, there's obviously um, the societal arbitrary programming that's input into my brain, but then once it gets onto my brain or the CD, there is now a physically fact about me and about the CD, which is programmed in there um, that does determine which rule I'm following. Cause I, a CD doesn't know what programming is doing, obviously, but human brains do. Like when we add numbers, we know we're trying to get to the next number. Like if if supposedly we get to 55 and it changes to five and the and the elementary school teachers didn't tell us this, they would have they would have failed at their job. They, they're supposed to tell us what, what the next number is. And so if there's some key rule in the system that we're supposed to be following, that would have to have been told to the people who would be following it. Otherwise, they can't be following that rule because they're following the other one, the one that doesn't have this change. Mm -hmm. So in what sense are you following the rule in the way that you're talking about it right now? So like it I sounds like what you're saying is just some determinant process which causes you to make a certain utterance. It doesn't sound like following a rule. Uh, well, so like I would say if uh, elementary school teacher told me that after you get to 55, you, there, she's teaching the addition. She said after you get to 55, after the number that I thought is five or whatever, then I would know this in my brain. And so when I was doing addition, I would be following this rule. I'd be like, okay, 54 or, or one, two, three, four. And I'd be like, yes, yeah, so when I get to 55, I have this knowledge in my brain that it just goes to five. So I'd be following the rule because I, I know my brain has been programmed to after I hit that number, go to five, just like I could write into a, a computer after you get to a certain number revert to five and so we know what what uh rule the computer is following because it's literally programmed right there into the computer once you get to 55 go to five and the same programming exists in my brain because i've been taught that 
or the lack of being taught, that means I'd be following the alternative rule. And so I could know what rule I'm following the same way I could know what rule the computer is following because it's literally programmed into the computer. Do this one, not that one. Mm -hmm. So when, so just so I understand, when you say that you were taught addition in elementary school, what do you think you were taught? What do I think I was taught? Um, yes. What did they teach you to do? Uh, well, in this analogy, I'm trying, I'm taking it from the perspective of the quadition. Say I was taught quadition. For me to have uh -huh. been taught quadition, they have to teach me, here is the point where it changes. And so that is a fact that is in my brain that I've been taught to do. And if that fact hasn't been taught to me, then I can't be doing quadition. Why not? Uh, because... I haven't been taught there's a change, therefore I'm following whatever the alternative rule is where there's no change. And so so how do we know? Part. So let's uh, let's uh, say I'm the elementary school teacher and I'm trying to teach you addition. Do, I don't teach you how to add numbers all the way up to alf not. Uh, sure. they, they, they always stop at some arbitrary, <laughs> uh, some arbitrary point. So, you know, maybe the hundreds, maybe the thousands, maybe the hundreds of thousands, but, you know, <clears throat> they don't teach you how to add 500,364,926 plus a Googleplex. I mean, they just don't teach you that sort of stuff. You're supposed to like carry on in the sort of same way. And it's that carrying on in the same way <clears throat> that if your society expects a certain answer, that's the skeptical solution. Um, to say, well, all we mean by following the rule is doing what other people in your community expect you to do. Uh, so that's the kind of solution that's the skeptical solution um, because it doesn't, so I guess the kind of ground rules of the debate are that we're looking for two things. We're looking for something that's gonna make it the case that you are doing addition versus quadition, but also something that you, in your uh, mind justifies your answer. That, that you could appeal to and say, look, this is the reason <clears throat> why I carried on in one way versus the other. So in the case of the elementary school teacher, they may be merely teaching you quadition, uh, but they just never got up to the point where it changes. You know, um, lots of times in math, they, they wait until you get to a higher level of math to introduce some new function, some new way of thinking of things, um, et cetera. So, you know, if, if you, uh, ask an elementary school kid about negative numbers, they, they tend to say, what are you talking about? Some of them discovered on their own perhaps, but they're not taught about that stuff till later. So for, how do we know that the elementary school isn't teaching you quadition, namely the part that is addition up until it changes? So that you well, would so be carrying on doing what they're doing, but then when you get to a certain point, uh, you know, I mean, the whole skeptical point kind of assumes that your whole past history of adding is consistent with also quadding. Um, and it sounds like what you're saying is you don't think that that part is true. So that's what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, I don't think that part is possible. So like in the elementary school example, suppose they're trying to teach me quadish and they just never got to the point that it gets back to five, then I just mm -hmm. wouldn't be doing quadition because they, one of the key rules of quadition, they didn't teach me. So I'm not doing quadition because they haven't taught me the key rule of what makes something quadition and not quadition. So I'd be doing the alternative because I'm, not I'm incorrectly doing quadition, which therefore would mean I'd correctly be doing not addition or something. And so it seems so, but, like, but I'll try. Go ahead. Yeah. So, so it seems like the determining factor is whoever's doing the programming is going to program me to do one rather than the other, whether they intend to or not. So their intention, I don't think makes a difference. I'm going to be programmed in such a way that I'm going to follow one of these patterns. And by looking at my programming, I can know which pattern I'm following. So like, I think think looking at it from a perspective of a computer rather than a person makes it easier. The computer is going to do one or the other. And so we can know which one the computer is going to do either by looking at the programming and say, this, this is exactly what it's going to do. And we can know exactly what's going to happen when it goes to 55. Or we can know by looking at the laws of physics that it just determined that when things get to 56, they go to five or whatever. And so we can know either way what's going to happen. Um, and so why would we, wh where is the ambiguity when looking at it from the perspective of a computer? We would just look at its programming, know which one, right? So why, why would that not work in this case for a human by looking at their brain programming in the same sense? Um, so when it comes to computers, we program them. 
Um, and that's, that's uh, so we input the thing that we want it to be doing. But if a calculator fell from the sky, like, you know, and it, it came from Alpha Centauri or something like that, and we had good reason to believe that it came from Alpha Centauri, uh, then there, what fact about that calculator would determine whether it's doing quadition or addition, especially given that calculators are finite devices that, you know, will return an error result once you get to too big a number. So how, what about that thing would make it the case that you, um, th how would you apply this answer to that? Let's look at the programming. I think we can still take a, a calculator, look at the programming, and then know what it's going to do, when it's going to give the error message, uh, which rules it's following. Um, so yeah, supposedly the Alpha Centauri analogy is meant to show that we can't look at the programming because it's in a different language or something. Um, but since well, it's, it's meant to show that we don't know what the program is. Sure, sure. And so, but whether or not I think that whether or not we know what the program is seems like a separate question to the first question, which is, is there a fact about the calculator that we can look at to know which rule it's following? And I, I would say, yes, if there was a calculator that fell from Alpha Centauri, whether or not we could know it, there is programming in that calculator. And if we could read it, it would tell us for a fact of the matter, which one it's following. We'd be able to answer that question. Uh -huh. So I, I mean, this is brings up the other kind of related point to this, which is that the skeptical argument's also supposed to apply to uh, programming machines, and Kripke kind of uses this as an argument against functionalism to suggest that we can't be uh, implementing <clears throat> some kind of uh, program or something like this because we can't really tell what. So, so the skeptical challenge is that you can never be sure that the error message that you receive is really telling you what you think it is, as opposed to being part of the computation. So, so Kripke says, look, if a, if a machine breaks down, then you would say, look, it's broken. Um, but someone who's really clever and really good at designing things may have built that into the design so that the, the physical breaking might be part of his computing some other function. Sure, I, I would agree, but I, I'm still focused on that main question. Is there something about the calculator that we could look at that could tell us which language it's using, and the answer would still seem to be yes. Which thing would it be? Programming. That the physical computing language, uh, whether it's binary or some kind of physical system in it, we should be able to look at the physical uh, switches in the, in the calculator to know what thing it's going to do in any given situation. And we could just say, this is the one it's doing. In any given situation, even in ones that it will break down and even ones that are too big. <laughs> yeah. I mean. Yes. I how... think that's, if we look at the programming of any calculator, um, we should be able to know exactly what it's going to do in any given situation at all. That's assuming that you know what the program is. <laughs> so the, 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 the question is. Well, do, so, does it? <clears throat> yes. But because even if I don't know what the program is, the question is, is there something about the program, whether I know it or not, is there something about the calculator that determines what language it's doing? And I think necessarily there either has to be. I think necessarily anything the, the calculator is going to do has to be determined by the physical parts of the calculator. I'm a physicalist, naturalist, think all there is is physical stuff. So anything the calculator is going to do is going to be physically determined by the physical parts of the calculators. So the program is just an analogy to say the the physical dominoes that have been set up in the calculator and so if i know the programming then i know all of the possible things it could ever do and what it's going to do in any situation now i may not be able to know that but whether or not i'm able to know that seems to be a separate issue to the question which is is there something about the calculator that that will determine which language it's following and i think the answer is obviously yes there has to be it's all physically determined and so barring quantum mechanics, random fluctuations. Yeah, there's got to be one determined way it's going one way or the other. Uh -huh. But that won't determine, I mean, even if you grant that, which I, I think there's some a reason you could uh, challenge that, but even if you grant that, it's not going to nail down that it's addition versus quadition for numbers that can't calculate. So if you say, uh, here's the calculator. It has internal states X, Y, and Z, and internal states X, Y, and Z tra transition to states X prime, Z prime, and Y prime, or whatever, and you map all of that stuff out, that still may just be the part of the 
quadition function, which overlaps with addition. So why think that you could extrapolate from there to things that it isn't able to add and say, well, it's do, it would do the same thing then. Well, so I think for it to be doing quadition, there would have to be programmed into the calculator some kind of transition. Say it couldn't get to 52. It was just too small, didn't have enough binary switches or whatever. In order for it to be doing quadition, you would have to say there was some programming in there that says if get to 52, go to five, even if it was impossible for it to do this. Um, otherwise, it can't be doing quadition because it doesn't have the rule of quadition is doing the other one. And so if it if we gave it more processing power and let it continue, if it didn't already entail this rule, once 55 go to five, then it would do the opposite. It would do the alternative rule um, because that, that rule is programmed into it. And so it seems like unless the alternative rule is already pre-programmed into the calculator, then it must all be following the other one because it's going to be doing the other one necessarily. Well, so why not interpret the error as it doing quadition at that point? I mean, so it can't return those values for it. So it's always every calculator is built to just work on some finite set of uh, the number system. Um, and, you know, I mean, abstracting away that we built this program, so we know what program put into it. That's kind of cheating a little bit. But if you just start like literally from not knowing what the what the original designer had in mind, then it's sort of question begging to say the original designer had in mind. <clears throat> this function as opposed to that function just by looking at what it is able to do. Sure. Oh, I would agree. So I, would, I wouldn't, because if we get the error message, that doesn't tell us one way or the other. I would say you'd have to look at the programming and have in the program, and it's going to have to say all of the things it can do. And then you could say, well, it stops at 52 or something. Well, let's say if we <sighs> look at the pattern prior to that and continue that pattern, um, in anywhere in that prior pattern doesn't entail a change. And the answer would be presumably no, because it didn't have the processing power. And then you could say there's a quadition calculator and then it say would, would entail a change at some point. There would be in programmed, even if it wasn't able to get to a number, it would say at this big number, do a change. And so we could look at the programming and know which one's, go, what it's going to do. Um, and so we could know which system it's following. And so it would, even though the intention, I don't really care about the intention of the designer because that doesn't matter because someone could intend to do quadition and accidentally do addition or whatever. But we could look right. at the physical system of the calculator and know what it's going to do by saying if it has an exception clause to do something different at some point. Whether or not it reaches that point it doesn't make a difference because if it's not programmed to do an exception, then it won't do the exception. If it is programmed to do the exception, then it will do the exception. And so whether or not there's that exception clause gives us a determining factor to know which system it's following, it seems like. Yeah, but why would the exception clause have to be built in uh, <clears throat> in order for, I mean, so if, you, if you're if you building something that is just supposed to add numbers up to 52 and, and quadition kicks in at 55, then why would you build in the exception rule? Because you're just kind of, the designer is just trying to capture a part of it, which is, uh, you know, overlaps with the other function. Sure. Well, you build in the exception rule to make sure it's following quadition. If it didn't do that, it wouldn't be following quadition. So like if you, if I teach an elementary school kid to add things up and I just don't tell them that once you get to 52, it goes to five, well, then they won't be following quadition. They know which rule they're following. They're following the not quadition rule because they aren't including that exception rule that is required to make something quadition. And so if that exception rule is included in there, if I tell you, once you get to 55, do five, even when they're doing the one plus two plus three to get to six, they're following quadition. We know they're following quadition because they have that rule built in that once you get to 55, go to five. And so we can know whether or not they're following one rule or the other based on whether or not this exception rule has already been built into their programming. Do you think the non-exception rule is built into regular addition? Um, maybe. I mean, otherwise it doesn't seem like you could say that the calculator is really adding <clears throat> if there's nowhere explicitly where it says like, <clears throat> keep going on forever like this, or there's no exceptions to this or something like that. And that's not really how addition is uh, programmed into the calculator. Um, Cause that does sound to me, like uh, adding, you can always add. It's, that's something that is taught to kids that it, you could, it always goes higher, it always goes up to one. There is always a rule of uh, continuation or continuation rule. And I would assume the same for the calculator that 
even though it wasn't overtly programmed in the calculator, um, because the system doesn't have a stopping point, it, it's in program. But it does have a stopping point physically, like it can't add numbers higher than a certain value. Oh, sure. So there we get an error message at a certain point, but we can know that if the programming of the system could continue going on binaries, it's like it's one, one, zero, one, zero, one, 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 whatever. And so we can continue the system indefinitely. And so it would follow the same rule as what we tell the kids. It just doesn't stop. Even though we didn't overtly say it doesn't stop because the pattern that's built into the program of the computer doesn't have a stopping point. And so by definition, it wouldn't stop. Um, and so it, it would does seem to entail by looking at the program in the calculator that the system does continue indefinitely without stopping. There's no exception rule to tell it to stop. Therefore, that would overtly be a rule that it doesn't stop and continues forever, just like telling the kid that it doesn't, it just keep, keeps going. Well, so, I mean, I, I, it seems to me like there's a little bit of a tension between the two things that you're saying. So on the one hand, um, what you're saying is if the thing is not built explicitly into it, then you're not doing quadition. But on the other hand, you're saying it's okay that it's not explicitly built into it to do addition. Well, no, I, I'm saying it is explicitly built into it to do addition. So in addition, every time you add one, it continues to go up forever without stopping because there's no uh, exception clause to stop it. Therefore, the pattern from the past will continue into the future indefinitely. Um, and so if we there's any change to that, you would need an exception clause. So in version one, if there's no exception clause, you're doing the the pattern, the the system that has no changes. It just continues on. And then for any version with an exception clause, you need to add the exception clause for it to be that system. So you think the default is just regular addition? I mean, because um, the way the calculators are programmed, again, is that they just take some finite list. It's like a multiplications table. It's like there's no rule that's embodied by the multiplications table. You just look up the two numbers and you find there <clears throat> the number that's written there and you write that down as the answer, which is the way people are taught multiplication at an early age or addition as well. Um, you, you're, not, you're not taught some algorithm. You're taught, you know, here's the answer. <laughs> is it one plus one is two, one plus two is three and so forth. So you learn these things in that way. <clears throat> and there's some, like you could think of an addition table that lists all the numbers and then the product of the sum of the two, not the product. Um, and that's what's built into the computer. It's a finite state automaton. Um, so it's got only a finite set of states and it doesn't have anything about continuing on after that. It's not as though, you know, the axioms of arithmetic are built into calculators. It doesn't say for all X, X is a number and the successor of, of N is N plus one. It doesn't say anything like that inside the calculator. Doesn't it? Because in most programming languages, what we write is just continuation, like one plus one equals n or whatever, and just press it and it just goes. It's not like, I don't think there's like a, a table for each of the individual numbers. It just, there's a table for like the first 10 and just continues adding them. So well, I think like in, like in programming, we do actually do the continuations of the numbers like that, where there's a system that it's supposed to follow, like binaries is, is zero, zero, one, zero, one. Um, one, one, zero, zero, and it just continues that pattern indefinitely until there's an exception rule, which we do include exception rules because we want it to stop before it breaks the computer. So we have exception rules that must be built in in order to stop it from going down the system. And so I would say that addition, the continuation version is the default simply because it's the simplest version. It's the one that's, that's that you first program and then you have to add an exception rule to make it um, be something different. And so mm -hmm. if we just have the continuation rule and we don't have any exception rules, then you're going to be doing the continuation language or meaning. And once you add an exception rule, then you're going to be doing the exception rule meaning. And if you don't add that exception rule, then even if you were attempting to program the computer to do quadition, it won't be because it doesn't have the exception rule. So it will be doing quadition wrongly. And you could know that by looking at its programming, it seems like. So how could you know whether it's doing quadition <clears throat> or addition wrongly? Because you just said, you, you, I think it's an important point that we do make mistakes. And um, if, if you allow that you can make a mistake and still be doing addition, um, then you could allow that you can make a uh, mistake and still be doing quadition. So this may you know, be a similar kind of case. Uh, well, so we look at the programming and say it doesn't have an exception rule. If it's not, it doesn't have an exception rule, then it's going to continue on the standard rule indefinitely. And whatever we label the 
continuation version, that's the one that's doing correctly. I mean, I still don't really see how you get out of the uh, the idea that the E might be the exception rule, um, that a clever designer might have made that the ex uh, uh, an implementation of the exception rule. Um, Can you say that again? So that part I'm, I'm not understanding. So the, the basic idea is that we take a system to be malfunctioning when it uh, breaks or returns a value that we don't accept. Um, uh, but a clever designer might have made that as part of the design. So maybe the exception rule is, you know, once you get up to quadition, you just get the E. And that's built sure. in. Sure. So like we could say um, that, that the, we look at the programming of the calculator and once it gets to a certain number, it shows an error message or something. And now it's doing the error addition. Error addition? It's doing the error addition because after... 2 billion, it just says error message or whatever. And then you could say that the calculator is doing error addition because it's, it's whatever it's adding up after a certain number, it shows error and that would be fine. I, I would be happy to grant that the calculator is doing error addition. Well, I meant it's that it's doing, doing addition. quadition because instead of returning five, it returns E and E might simply be the designer's way of saying five. Well, sure, sure. But I would say it's not doing addition. It's doing addition incorrectly. It's got addition incorrect because once you add 10 billion plus one you don't get e you get 10 billion and two and so it's doing addition incorrectly and it's doing quadition correctly because it shows the e label after the number and we can know that by looking at this program we can show what it's going to do after it gets to a certain number and so we can determine which meaning it has um, by looking at this program in either way Right, but you're assuming that you know what the E stands for in each case, which is what I'm challenging. I mean, what the argument's challenging. So the designer might have made it so that the E signifies five, so that whenever you you quad uh, two numbers, it returns the value for the same as addition up to 55 and or 500 billion or whatever the number is, and then it returns E afterwise, and and that's supposed to be your sign that it's five. Sure. Why would so, that be? Uh... Well, because uh, the calculator no. is compatible. It could be interpreted as doing either. So you can't just look at the program and read it off. Is There's an exception either? rule in there. And the exception rule, you're interpreting it in one way, <clears throat> and the court would interpret it in another way. And the question is, what reason is there for one over the other? Uh, so let me see if I can reframe that. So let's say there's a calculator, it goes to 10 or whatever, and then after 10, it starts using letters. But the letters could represent regular numbers or they could represent a different, like the, the quadition numbers or something. Well, I'm just imagining the regular calculator, which you put in a big number and it returns E. And you're interpreting that as error. And the quad skeptic interprets that as five. Well, so I, the way I envision it is it's going to return an error after any number greater than whatever. And so there's, you get the same message every time. And so it can't mean different things every time because that doesn't make any sense. Right. It just means five. Mean, right. And so in that case, you know, it's not, whatever it's doing, it's not doing addition because you know that in order to get, there's going to be different numbers for each iteration you go higher than the the specified number and if it shows e for every one of those you know it's doing addition wrong because addition doesn't do that and so we know it's not doing addition it's doing a different variation whatever what variation it's doing you may not know because the the intention of what the e is supposed to mean you may be unknown and that's perfectly fine um wait so you, you know agree it's not doing that t-jump you agree that the regular calculators are not doing addition Yes, absolutely, because they aren't doing it correctly. Because they they stop, they they make mistakes. Calculators are dumb. They are not doing addition correctly. Um, they're doing a simplified version. They're doing a Newtonian addition. They make simplified mistakes. Uh huh. So that's that's why I mean I can't really understand whether you are accepting the kind of skeptical conclusion or not, because that's sort of what the skeptic says. The skeptic says calculators are not adding, and most people say yes, they are um they're perfectly they're adding perfectly fine it's just that there's a limitation on 
the storage in the device or something like that so that it gives you it, it can't add certain numbers uh after a higher value but <clears throat> but they would certainly say they're adding one plus one and giving you two but it sounds like what you're saying is no the calculator is not adding one plus one well that seems like a separate issue because my main challenge is the the question that you asked at the beginning is there something physically about the calculator that we can look at to know what rule it's following my answer is yes we can look at the programming um and then there's a separate issue of well, our calculators doing addition um that you know I, I i would be happy to grant calculators aren't doing addition like no they're, they're just simplified machines to do like the box system that you said i don't care whether they're doing addition or not um mm -hmm. but i that that question i think is not the one i'm interested in i'm interested in the in the first question is there something physically that we can look at at a at a uh, calculator at a person to know what meaning they intended. And I think the answer is yes, there has to be, it must necessarily be, um, barring quantum mechanical weirdness. There has to be, cause I'm a determinist. Their brain is determined. Whatever they meant must be determined by their brain. Yes. Um, I, I so I, everyone agrees by the way, no one wants to be a skeptic. Uh, the, the whole thing is like, how do you get out of this puzzle? <clears throat> Even Kripke, as far as I understand, wasn't really convinced by this and he said well there's got to be sort of what you're saying there's got to be something which answers this question but he could never figure out what it was which is what the what the big puzzle is so um the the question is there something internal to you which answers the question are you adding or quieting <clears throat> falls i mean so you say yes, and it's the programming. So the programming says here, so here's the programming. <laughs> and you say, according to the programming of the calculator, it's not doing addition. Sure. Okay, so what is the difference between you and the calculator? What is the difference between me? Because you well, admit that I... the calculator is not adding, but why do you think you are? Because I have been given the extra rule that it continues on indefinitely and doesn't stop. That's a rule and that I've you been know taught. You're... It... Sorry, go ahead. Well, that's a rule that I've been taught it exists in my programming. So if we added that programming to the calculator, then it would be doing addition. Um. So that's I. I, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. So do you think of this as a skeptical answer? Like, there's nothing about you all by yourself that determines this. No, because I think there is. I think that. There is in my brain the rule, it continues on forever. Because there is that rule, I am doing the addition. And if there was um, not that rule, then I would not be doing addition. So you think explicitly represented in your brain somewhere is the rule, do this forever? Yes, absolutely. Interesting. Okay. So... So there's two parts to the challenge. Um, one part is, can you say something that determines whether you're doing one thing or the other? The other thing is, does it justify you in giving your answer? So do you think that that's an important part of the challenge? Because I know you're a normative skeptic, so you might not even care about this stuff. I'm not, that part I don't understand. I didn't understand what, what do you mean by justify? Because I'm just thinking justify true belief. Do you have some kind of something that increases the probability of the belief being true yeah yes i think so do you think that sure. when you when you say i know i was adding that this rule thing that you say is written down in your brain is providing the 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 answer to why you should say one thing versus the other if i could look into my brain and see the rule like a list of rule sheets and know that those were part of my brain i would say yes i say here i can see on, on the on the fmri it gives me a list of bullet points that are programmed in my brain there it is i'm justified in believing i'm doing addition uh -huh. so you think absent that you're not um yes if i was unaware of the rules in my brain or what i was programmed to do i would not be justified in concluding which one i was doing okay so you sounds like you basically agree with Kripke because that's the conclusion of the argument is that there's no way for you to do the thing that you're talking about. You can't look into your brain and see which rules are written there, absent the context, absent the community of which you're a part. But there's nothing inside which radiates addition in this way, independently of what the community expects of you. 
I probably disagree with that because I think that anything the community teaches you is going to be physically determined by neurons in your brain, just like it's physically determined in a calculator. And so if you're doing yeah. addition in your brain, um, that rule that follow this rule infinitely is actually physically somewhere in your brain that if we could read it, you, you would know. So I think there is something physically there that you could know about. And then the second question, would you be justified in it? Um, I think like, obviously I can't look into my brain and see that there's that that rule physically exists in there, but I have reasons to believe that it does. Um, and so I would be justified in those reasons, which would then justify me in the po position that I'm doing addition. So because of, I know how brains work. I know what an fMRI is. I know that beliefs are stored in the physical system and neurons. I'm then justified in believing that because I have been taught this and that was stored in my memory, I'm justified in believing I'm doing addition. Uh-huh. So, huh. Why not think the other thing that uh, you're having some rule for quadition in there and you've just never reached the number high enough where it'll kick in? Because I have no evidence to justify that belief. And Well, sure you do. <laughs> All the evidence for you doing addition is also evidence for you doing quadition. So when I say evidence, I mean evidence of the exception rule. So I have evidence of the continue forever rule. That's something that's been taught to me. I have memories of this occurring. It could be false. Like it could be in the matrix and I was actually taught quotation. I just don't know it. But I have no evidence of the exception rule anywhere in my past history. Therefore, I'm not justified in believing I'm doing quadition, whereas I am justified in believing I'm doing audition because I have the continuation rule. I have been taught the continuation rule. And the continuation rule is do this forever. Yes. And forever means what? Um, when you add one, it always goes another one up. And you can always well, add How do one you know that it doesn't mean add one and it goes another one up until 55? Um, because explicitly the rule is it continues on forever. That's explicitly the rule. Yes, but the rule, one. but the word forever in the rule is compatible with this other meaning, namely that it goes on up to a certain point or else returns 55. Well, I would say the same thing. I just have no evidence to support the conclusion that the word forever has an exception rule. The word forever, as far as I know, does not have the exception rule, and I've been taught that as well. Well, in what way were you taught the word forever? In what way was I taught the word forever? Yes. Uh, in grade school. Um, and what did they, they tell, tell you? me? Forever means continuing on without ever stopping or changing. Uh-huh. And in the sentence, without ever stopping and changing, <clears throat> how do you know that the words stopping and changing don't have these alternative meanings? That you stop, well, that you go on up until a certain point and then don't. Because so all this of is the, a, what that thing, yeah. yeah. Because all of the explanatory analogies used are physical analogies that show a continuing pattern that does not ever change. And the the point of those analogies is to differentiate changing versus non-changing. And they explicitly highlight the non-changing uh, aspect into the definition of these words. In what way? Um, by using rocks. They say continuing rocks and they say don't stop. So they, they say, well, what's the next thing? The next thing is a rock to indicate that there is never a point where it changes to not be a rock. That is the intended explanation they are using. So whenever they say, well, what's, what's the next thing? Is there a change? The answer is no. And by saying this is, this pattern is the one we're going with. They explicitly bake into it that there is no change. And that is the meaning of the words. That is, that's what they convey to the children. There isn't a change. I mean, the problem, what we mean by the word forever. So when we think about the word grew, um, it means green up until 2025 or blue afterwards. So if you wanted to find all the grew things, right now you would collect all the green things. Sure. Okay. But so but but go ahead, yes. If you were explaining what a green versus a grew thing is to a child, you'd say a green thing is a thing that is green and does not change to blue. And so at times, is that what they told you? What? 
Who told you that? Who told me that? Well, I'm making this up right now. So I'm saying like, if I am an elementary school teacher and I'm trying to teach a uh, kid the difference between green and grew, a green thing is something that will remain green forever. Time 8 billion gazillion still green. And so if I'm explaining this to a kid <laughs> and I want to try to explain what the foreverness of the green is, I'm going to say it does not change. There is no change. That's what a green thing is. No change ever under any circumstances does not change. And I'm going to explain this by comparing things that change and things that don't change. And I'm going to put this in the category of not changing things. And that's going how I'm going to explain all of these words to them. I'm going to intrinsically bake into the fact that the meaning of these words entails no change ever. So you're a Platonist? uh no but you just described platonism <laughs> i mean green things do change and they're still green <clears throat> so a faded green thing is still green and an eaten sure. green apple was a green apple even though it has changed and is no longer green sure well so i'm trying to get to the definitions of forever and any analogous words the definitions of those words are they're not platonic objects but they're abstract objects and those abstract objects entail a not change variable. The not change variable is programmed into people when they learn this word. It is a part of the meaning. Um, and so we would know which system or which meaning they're using for these words because it's literally baked in. You, you must be doing this for it to be the meaning intended by these words. It does not change, not change. There's change and not change. This has to be in the not change version or you're doing not the correct language. Um, and so in the same context of math, if there is a change variable, you have to program that change variable in independently in order for them to be doing the added quotation. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not really sure I understand. I see people are talking about how we look this early in the morning, by the way, in the chat. I don't know why they're interested in that, but uh, thank you for noticing that I look so unhealthy at this early in the morning. Um, so, the question is, how do you know which of these you're doing? And what you're saying is, well, someone taught me that I'm doing this. Well, that would be the second stage. The first stage is it's determined in my brain physically which one I'm doing. So that part is it's physically determined which one I'm doing. And how am I justified in coming to that conclusion? Well, I have evidence. I don't, it may not be strong evidence. It's just something that increases the probability of the proposition being true or whatever. I have these memories of being taught this. Therefore, I have a justification in believing my brain is programmed in such and such way. Uh, by the way, whoever's saying that I'm a narcissist is a weirdo because I was talking to the person who said I look sick, not to them. So they seem like a narcissist to me. But anyway, <clears throat> well, how, how do you know do we're talking about qua qua quarsicists? They, they mean quarsicists. Yeah, right? I don't actually. I know. <laughs> So it's a good point. Um, <clears throat> so the, the question is like, you say, do the same thing forever. And I say, gee, forever, that's a long time. Like forever, forever. And no can do the same thing forever. Like that's literally impossible. So the, the rule, it sounds like you're building something into it, which is not physically possible. And which is still gonna leave open these kinds of puzzles about what's going to happen after the physical system breaks down because you will die at some point your brain will decompose and we still want to say well gee did you have a rule that said do it forever <laughs> uh because you can't follow that rule well sure we couldn't follow the rule but is that relevant to the the question because the question is yes is, the rule is, follows is the argument well the <laughs> question whether you is, can follow is, the rule is the whole question <laughs> I don't think so. I think the question is, is there a way to determine which rule you're following? Whether or not you can follow it seems to be a different question. So like, if there's a rule in my brain, suppose it's possible, brain says, continue this pattern forever. If that rule exists, then we should have an answer to the question. It should be, yes, there's the rule. And now you're bringing up a second question. Is that rule possible to program? I, I would say yes. I'd say programming languages do that all the time. We program that in, even though computers can't do it. We program things in to computers they can't do all the time. But that doesn't mean there isn't a rule there. The rule is there. And we can know what the rule is by looking at the programming, whether or not the computer has or will be able to ever get to the point where it executes on that rule doesn't seem relevant. Like it's, it's that doesn't, does that matter? I don't know. Um, 
but the the relevant question is 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 there a rule that we can or we can we know which rule they're following by looking at the program the answer would be yes i don't i don't see the relevance of the part you're bringing up about whether or not it can actually accomplish the rule well because it has to do with whether that's what the rule states so like when you say that the rule is written into the system in a certain way you're assuming that you know what the words in the rule mean and that the system is actually doing that as it unfolds as its state transitions unfold so that well, i would disagree it, there i when, would disagree there because um in, okay. the, in the analogy of the calculator we're not looking at the words when we're looking at the program we're looking at the physical system itself the physical consequences of the dominoes and the ones and zeros and so that's the part i'm saying is what's doing the determining not that the words like the words don't mean anything it's what those words cause in the physical system or the physical representation of those words that's doing the determining so we can look at the physical um determined system the way it's going to fall like dominoes to know which system is or which rules are built into there and we can build a series of dominoes that can represent continues on forever um in a meaningful way that would be my argument and if that is possible then there is a rule built into the calculator that we can find to know which one it's following so i mean i don't see okay so you have the rule the rule says uh well you say the rule determines a certain pattern of things and then yeah. you also say that rule determines that that pattern will will like continue indefinitely yes. so where's that part of it you said we're not looking at the words we're looking at its consequences the consequences are finite uh well no not the consequence so i'd say there's so, two parts that are built into the physical system of the calculator one is that there's a pattern one plus one equals two or whatever or one zero one zero what whatever and then there's another part that is lit another physical system that says this can uh, this pattern must not stop and that is also a physical there's some physical programming that is done in order to instantiate that rule and both of those things are in the calculator therefore we know it's doing addition and then if it has the uh, exception rule we know it's doing quadition and it has neither then it's either going to do audition or the error version if it shows an error message or whatever it doesn't have an error message it breaks or something but either way we know which system the calculator is following by looking at the programming um and <clears throat> as a human i think i have both of those rules built into my brain the addition follow the pattern and then the it never stops and both of those are physically determined parts of my neurology which i can look at if i could look at them and therefore mm -hmm. that answers the question um is there a part of me that determines and the answer is yes so the <laughs> the part that says it never stops <clears throat> is contradictory with the actual performance of the machine because it does stop Sure. So that 100%. opens up the interpretation of that rule in lines with the quadition. That namely, the never stop part is basically meaning up until a certain point and then stop. Um, because it so, does stop. So you so you can't sure. say that it will go on forever because it doesn't. What you could say is there's there's something written down that says continue until it doesn't until you, until you get to the part where it breaks down so that it's still the system is interpretable in each, each, either way well that's the part where at the beginning of the analogy i said it's either determined by the brain or by the laws of physics now obviously uh, the laws of physics are going to determine when the calculator breaks down but it if it never broke down we could say what rule we can know what it's going to do by looking at the rules and so granted but we either can't. it's so so the whole idea of the that someone clever enough who knew the laws of physics would know at what point this thing would break down and might have built that in so that it uh, stops at the quadition point. That might be exactly their intention. Well, th uh, that would be a part of the programming. That would be this thing we would know. And so we could then. Yes. And question. it's exactly the same as the regular thing you're pointing out. So. It's it's compatible with the never stop being written down in some way that it really means don't stop until you get to a certain number. If is, we, which is what happens actually. 
yeah, if we include the biological death of the organism as a part of the programming, yes, absolutely. But that would still be a part of the programming and we know which, which language it's using. So if we include that as a part of the programming, we know it's doing quadition or whatever. Exactly. But you don't know which one is it's doing is the whole point. You don't know um, what the program is. Because I still the think program... you do. How so like though? in the case of the system of the brain, the system of the brain operating, doing some intended goal of addition or whatever, it doesn't have the intended goal to stop at death. It is not, I don't, I don't not adding to know that, well, when I die, that is where, that is where the just stops and goes to error message or whatever. And that but is how not do you know that? that's been programmed into me because I wasn't taught that in elementary school. And so when but I'm doing a... addition. So, so do you, let me ask you this. Um, do you think that if you never went to elementary school, you wouldn't know what addition is? Um, possibly. Okay. So you'd be mystified by one plus one, by having an object and another object and then saying there's two of them there that would totally mystify you. If you hadn't uh, been, no, I, I don't, I don't think I'd have a language or a system to describe those things probably. But if you said, ugh and chug is blug or whatever words you came up with, you don't think that uh, these are kind of, you know, things that you might get outside of school? <laughs> sure. I think animals can do some form of addition, something, sure. Do you, so, so, okay, <laughs> then there you go. Um, what is not really the, the point. The point is whether you're doing that function, whether you're implementing a certain function. Yeah. There's a function called addition. There's another function called quadition. In fact, there's infinite functions. Um, and you can just write them down and that's perfectly fine. So how do you know that your biological death isn't part of the programming, which determines which function you're performing? That wasn't what you were taught um, in school, sure, but the teachers might not know what they're saying. Um, let's see, how, how I didn't, don't know how to even try to answer that right now. Um, Cause that would, that would entail that every organism would have a different system based off of its time of death, essentially. Um, that yes, that's a, that's a huge, that's the skeptic. <laughs> exactly their point is that you can't, there's no facts that you can point to about anything that's in the brain, in the system at all, which makes it the case that you're doing addition versus quadition versus small addition versus anything that you want. So exactly the conclusion that you just said is supposed to be the <laughs> conclusion of the argument. I don't see the how that can be meaningfully translated as analogous to the programming. Like based on what we mean by a program or rule or whatever, to say that your the rule is contingent on the organism's lifespan is does not compute as a logical sentence to me. Well, why not? Um, because of what rules are seem to be some kind of a pattern that can be described um, within a system and biological death of the organism does not seem to be such a such a thing that can be abstractly described in that way. Why? I don't understand why you think that though, because a, a clever designer might be able to use all sorts of features of the system to implement a given function. I'm sure they could, but it seems like the use of the word rule um, would mean not that. So like when we say what rule are we following? The rule seems to refer to some kind of abstraction, like a, a set of principles or something. And your biological lifespan does not seem to be a rule in that sense. Well, it might be part of the implementation of a rule. So the biological lifespan is in itself a rule, but it might be the way that a clever designer chose to implement a certain rule. That, it that seems like might, it's, there's, it's arbitrary that there's no connection between doing audition or whatever system and your lifespan. It seems like there's an, 
completely arbitrary connection there. And so if we're asking. Yeah. But there's a completely which, arbitrary connection between addition and uh, uh, values of electricity in a register. Well, I'd say that would not be arbitrary. Between... Whoa, really? Yeah, how, yeah, how that's so? physically determined. I mean, that's not arbitrary. That's physically determined. We couldn't do that. Any we can make it any way we want. I mean, we can. No, we cannot. We are not. There's physical limitations to what we can do with a calculator. That is physically determined by the laws of physics. And so it's not arbitrary. Um, well, but I mean, which values we assign to which electrical currents? I think that's also physically determined. I don't think you can do that any way you want. I think it's literally physically determined. Um, whereas I don't what, what see do you that mean by any... that? So you don't, you don't believe that uh, computation and its implementation, implementation uh, you, can, you can implement a computation any way that you want to? You don't think that you nope. can implement a Turing machine using dominoes or using people holding mirrors or any of these standard ideas in computer science? I uh, I don't think you get it to output anything you want it to. I didn't say output anything you want to. I said you could implement the program in any way you want. Uh, so it's arbitrary what that we happen to use. I mean, old computers had vacuum tubes. These computers that we're talking through right now don't have vacuum tubes. It's totally arbitrary what the stuff inside um, is made of. What what's what's important is whether it corresponds to this abstract function. I am lost on trying to build this into the argument. The biological death is entailed in the program thing. I'm lost on how to build that into the argument. Well, because the idea is that if you build a system, like I'm a programmer, so I want to program something into it, but I'm a very good designer. Um, so what I do is I make it the case that this thing will implement a certain function uh, by breaking down at a certain point. Sure. Okay. So I make it so that it, uh, it implements the quadition function by returning the values that would agree with addition up into some value n and then breaking down at some point where the quadition uh, kicks in. And that's how I design the system. It's not a deficit of the system that it breaks down or returns an error. It's not a deficit of the system that it, it, it dies or whatever. That's, I built it into it because that's the way I want the, the function to be implemented. So like I keep going back to thinking what, I'm doing addition, I have some conscious intention of doing stuff and then my biological death seems to be a completely separate unrelated thing of course it seems um, to you that way you didn't design the system the question is how do you know like what rules out that this isn't a part of the implementation of this other function You know, like a, for a simple example, suppose that I have a, a security system on, on my door and I want it to be the case that uh, if you put the wrong code into the door, it won't open. But if you put the right code into the door, it short circuits and the lock opens. Now that may be, according to you, a very inefficient way to implement this function, but it's still a way to do it, namely having the code open the door. So I just designed it so that putting that code in short circuits the system, thereby unlocking the door. That's how, if that's how I designed it, then that thing is performing correctly, this function of unlocking the door. So, I mean, that's just one simple way you could build malfunction in. I mean, I don't think that's very practical, but still it could work. Sure. So there, so breaking down is compatible with implementing some function if you designed it the right way. Something that you might think is an error, you might say, oh, that thing's short-circuited, it's not working right. But someone who designed it might say, um, yeah, that's exactly how I designed it. That's what it's supposed to do. 
And you would say, gee, that's weird. And I say, yeah, so. <laughs> so that's the question is, you, you would say, that's a very weird way to implement this function. And they would say, yeah, but it's still a way to do it. Well, so, because what I'm thinking is, so I have in my, I've been programmed to think that addition goes on forever and then I die. I'm not going on forever. Um, but somehow there was a programmer who said it this way, so I couldn't go on forever. But yes. I still have the program that goes on forever in my brain. So from my perspective, well, um, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. When I've been taught the rules, if I wrote down all the rules, that's a system and we can know what system that is. There's a system of rules and there's this extra rule of me dying or something. And that would be in <laughs> conflict with the first set of rules. So, so the first set of rules goes on forever without changing. And the second set of rules goes on until biological death or something. Uh -huh. and so i from my perspective it seems like which rule i'm following is still the one that's in my brain that i'm determined to write down the set of rules if i write down the set of rules this is the one i'm doing um and if there are other things that can interfere with those rules that does not seem to be a part of the rules that i'm following because it's not consciously verified a set of what the rules I'm trying to do or whatever the rules I've been taught. So I wouldn't be justified in believing those things. I would not be justified in believing I'm doing biological death quadition or whatever. I would be justified in believing I'm doing audition because I can list this as here's the set of principles I'm doing. I'm following and here's what they say it continues on forever. And so in that case, it seems like I can still answer the question of, which rule have I been following? I'm following the one that the principles I write down, this is the set of rules I'm following. And those would be the ones I'd be justified in believing. And then the alternative biological quadition ones would seem to be like back to the matrix argument. Like, could that be the case? Yes. Do I have any justification to believe that? No. But I think you do have justification to believe it. And it's the same justification that you have for believing the other one, which is that you, you look at the rule, it's compatible with two interpretations. So one interpretation is go on forever in exactly the same way. The other interpretation is go on forever until Tuesday. Well, so this is where I see this as the analogy to the matrix argument. Like, how is that different from saying I'm justified in believing we're in the matrix because everything I'm seeing around me is compatible with us being in the matrix? Uh, that is your reason for being justified that you're in the matrix right now. In fact, I think you are justified for thinking that you're in the matrix. Um, so I would disagree. I'd say that uh, justification comes with novel prediction. So I'd say you predict something in the future. But because I, it seems like so problem under determination, there's always infinitely many ways to explain all data granted. Um, but doesn't mean you're justified in believing any of those infinitely many ways. I'd say no. And so, well, like if you're not no justified, memory. so sorry, go ahead. I don't mean to keep interrupting you. It was not, it's not, not an issue. Um, so like in the case of, I have memories of being taught uh, mathematics in one way. So I'd be justified in believing that way. I have no memories of being taught quadition. So I'm not justified in believing quadition. So based on the experiences I've had, um, I'm justified in believing, what is it? What is that called? Uh, no defeaters thing. The is if there's no defeaters, I'm justified in believing it, whatever. Um, I forget what that's called. But based on whatever system I start with, I'm justified in believing that system or what my intuitions initially hold. And not all of these alternatives. Because it's I mean, the skeptical right. argument is supposed to be that you're not justified in believing any of them. <laughs> so I'm not but, sure why you can rule out all the other ones and just get to pick one. So like the matrix thing, um, whether you're phenomenal in a simulation right now. Phenomenal, phenomenal conservatism, is that it? Yeah, phenomenal conservatism, yeah. But it's compatible with phenomenal conservatism that you've been doing quadition your whole life. That's the point I've been trying to make. Well, sure, but it's compatible that we're in the <clears throat> matrix as well. Exactly. So I don't, that's why in our last conversation, I compared this to the matrix analogy. I don't see how this is any different from the matrix analogy. The matrix argument well i mean i also think you don't know that you're not in the matrix 
So I would be a skeptic also about whether you have that kind of knowledge. I mean, the, the skeptical claim here is that about what counts as meaning that you can't know that you're in the matrix as well. I believe that there is no way to prove that you're not in the matrix. So you are justified in believing to some extent or other that you are in the, uh, that you are in a simulation. And contrary to these very confident assertions in the chat, there is no way for you to know that you are in the matrix. Like how, how would you rule that out? So like there's lots of arguments against matrix and solipsism. Like I have hands, whatever that argument is. I have hands. You would have hands <laughs> in the matrix as well. Right. Um, and so are you justified in believing you're not in the matrix? Sure. Based on this argument, both would be justified. Um, but then you can make arguments like which one's simpler or something. And so based on simplicity, the not matrix argument is simpler or the addition argument is simpler because it doesn't have an exception. How is it whatever. simpler? Well, no exceptions. This is literally just... Isn't that by definition simpler? Um, no, <laughs> it's actually, I would say much less simple to believe that you're not in the matrix right now because the general argument, I mean, this is kind of switching topics now, but it's related. The general argument is that uh, if there ever exists a time in the future where there are <clears throat> realistic stimulated worlds, then any given creature with experience like ours is more likely to be in one of those as opposed to uh, in the non-simulated world. So it would actually be like really, um, you know, unsimple of you to assume that you're in the non-simulated world because you have to assume that you're really lucky. Well, so like in the addition one, the addition would be simpler than quad addition because quad addition entails a deviation of some kind. And so would you admit that that was addition would be the simpler version of than quad addition or whatever? Yeah. And so in the case of the biological death quad addition or whatever, that would be less simple. There's an extra rule there or something. Uh, I so would it say like... it's less simple. Yeah. So I mean, each one has an extra rule. So in that way, um, not really, but uh, in the sense that the extra rule in your case is just go on forever. And the extra rule in the quadition case is like stop at some point and say five. So they each have an extra rule. And I don't know if going on forever is simpler than stop and say five. I don't know. They both have an amendment. So maybe they're not. Hmm. But yeah, so I see the conversation at two levels. One is like, like the pragmatic justification level um, below the matrix level. And then there's the meta. The meta metaphysics level of our, are we at the matrix level? And when answering the question from the pragmatic level, I can look at the brain and say, brain's programmed to do this. And based off of what the brain's programmed to do, you can tell what rule it is. And then you can say, well, maybe the biological programming of the brain to die at some point is entailed in the programming or something. But that seems yes. so, um, beyond, it's incomprehensible to me, I guess would be the right word. And because it's incomprehensible to me, uh, I'm I can't I'm un I'm not justified in believing that that's justified. Whereas I'm not sure I'm, why it's incomprehensible. I mean, you you about the calculator that returned the e. You agreed that that could be a uh, <clears throat> an indication that it was following some other um, program. In fact, you did uh, say that. So the e error is similar to the biological to breaking down in some way well to me the the breaking down is like the, the calculator is doing a thing and then somebody comes along and just smashes it with a hammer like that's a part of the program we like no no it literally is not part of the programming that would someone just smashed it with a hammer that's totally different and so that's why it's incomprehensible to me because there's like yeah we're not talking about smashing with a hammer we're talking about breaking down like according to like the physical laws like so someone someone who designed the system wouldn't be able to predict that you came along and smashed it with a hammer, but they would be able to predict that after 25 years, this component would break down or after 150,000 uses, this button would, would wear off or something like that. Or after 60 to 75 years, you would die. Those things 
are different than smashing with a hammer. I'm not talking about running over with a car. I'm talking about biological, natural, uh, you know, malfunctioning um, in, in the way we would normally cause it. So I agree with you there that we're not, the hammer smashing isn't part of it. It's literally like the physical decomposition of the thing. Or well, the to me, that would be a, error. Sure. Well, to me, that would be analogous to the hammer smashing. That's why it's incomprehensible to me because including like the biological death of a person as a part of the programming would be like including the hammer smashing of the calculator as the programming of the calculator. And to me, that seems like a category or there's like something that doesn't make sense there. That's why it's incomprehensible. It does not compute to try to include that as a part of the programming. It's not, does not fit into what I mean by those words. And so when I look at the, well, but you're just not a good programmer then (laughs) possibly, but it's, it's incomprehensible to me. I don't know. I don't, it does not make sense to me. Um, but you so don't. Lock, what about my lock analogy? You didn't buy that. Lock the lock analogy. Yeah. Um, so trying to make a pattern in the lock analogy. Uh, what what language was the lock using? Was the lock using? Uh, Suppose I have a keypad that controls the lock. Yeah. And I built it so that if you put the wrong code in, it beeps at you. But if you put the correct code in, it misfires, and the lock opens. Yeah. So there's where the destruction of the system is implementing the opening function. Yep. So you could still look so at that. The, doesn't make sense to you? The, the, that part makes sense. So, yeah, we look at the programming of the keypad. And if you put in certain buttons, it opens. And if you put in the other ones, it doesn't open. So it seems like we could know what language it's using in the same way. Look at the programming. Right, but the point is that the system breaking is part of it working correctly. So that does make sense. Is, All right. Is so like point. in the, in that one, you're you're doing the pattern, and then the pattern causes some kind of a interaction, like it opens either by breaking or not breaking. Um, and so, if that fit into like the the biological death, if counting to a certain number causes everyone to die or something maybe that would be that would fit the analogy i guess it does um, it does i mean start counting now and then when you die there's the number it, well, counting you will never be able it's just that's the way it works well that part that the, that's the part that doesn't seem to make sense to me that's like well eventually the keypad is going to decay or rust or whatever and that would including that as a part of the program and it seems to be analogous to the hammer smash like it does not that does not compute to me um so it seems like there's layers to what we mean by programming there one is the physical constituents of the of the printed circuit board and the other is the external stuff that's not on the printed circuit board and so right. when i'm talking about programming i want to limit it to the some kind of I don't know, governing system within the object, the PCB or the brain. And it, only the, the principles or the, the whatever bullet point principles of what it's trying to accomplish count as programming. It's physical limitations in the world don't seem to count as programming to me. Um, but I don't see the like physical limitations adjustment. aren't programming. The question is, could a clever designer who knew about the physical limitations use those physical limitations as a way of implementing the program? Sure. But the question and is, the answer I mean, seems obviously yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But the question would be is, am I uh, justified in believing that I'm doing addition? Even though I don't, even though that's possible, I'd like, yes, it still seems like I can, I can rationally conclude that my brain is doing addition because I have these set of principles, one of which is continue on forever, even though knowing my brain's going to die. And even though knowing the Christian God could have designed it this way because he wanted me to do quidition or whatever, I still think I'm justified in believing I'm doing addition, not because I don't think that those aspects would be normally considered to, to be a part of the rule following. That doesn't, to me, that seems well, first of all, we're, oh, there's two things, remember. The one is, is there something that is the rule? The other is, can you follow that rule? So we've been all this time mostly talking about just that first thing. Um, is there something which you could identify as the rule? Um, sure. And that's what I've been challenging this whole time. What I've been saying is that 
anything that you put out as a candidate as being the rule which is implemented in the system there will be another interpretation of that which is in line with the skeptics and that therefore it really is true that Kripke's claim that the entire past history is compatible with either rule being followed so you keep trying to rule out that it's the past history is compatible with this other rule being followed <clears throat> and that's what i'm challenging i'm challenging the idea that uh, um, your past history makes it the case that you've only been doing adding because the whole argument starts with the questioning of that and saying well no in fact you were wrong <laughs> the entire time in the past when you thought you were giving the right answers in your school you're given the wrong answers um and you say no i wasn't i was doing addition and i say how do you know and then this you say okay well because there's something in there that says go on forever and then you just reinterpret that and say well go on forever and or stop on tuesday or go on until the system breaks down um etc well that's the part that i think so, is incoherent because those those are contradictory things those those two rules contradict one another and so if we're trying to determine which way? one well, if one says go on forever and one says go on forever until you die, that's not going on forever. So those are literally... Well, it depends on what forever means. Well, sure. So um, if we take the general understood meaning of the words, they would be a contradiction. And yeah, so but the whole question is whether to... you can have that. <laughs> well, yes, but, but so here's here's the part where I'm getting stuck. I'm trying to determine which, when I'm saying I'm following a rule, what are the things we are allowed to say are built as a part of that rule um and if there was a, some crazy designer who did this we should be able to look at all of the physical parts of the universe to know the programming of the universe and we could still answer that question um just like we could for a smaller system of a calculator we could know for the calculator what it's doing if we're only looking at the things inside the calculator ignoring its physical heat death, we could know what it's doing. And then if we could include its heat death or breaking down, we could know what it's doing. And if we could include the universe, we could know what it's doing. In all of the cases, if we could look at the programming, we could know what it's doing. Um, right. And, but in the calculator, you admitted, I thought that you, that's not the case. For which thing? For the calculator. for the calculator so if we look at the calculator and we know what's it's been if it has the rules of go on forever we know it's doing addition even if it can't go on forever so it's physical limitations of it being unable to do so seem irrelevant but it has that program in it go on forever it's doing addition and then we look at can it go on a tradition no it can't it's going to physically break down and now if we right. include that as a part of the rules we're looking at it's doing quadition or whatever that's the part that doesn't make sense to me. But we could, we could still, we could still look at all of the system. We could still know what it's doing by looking at all of the rules of the system. In that case, it would still be a determining factor of which one it's doing. It's doing quadition because it's it's part of its programming is it's going to break, so it's doing quadition. And so either way, if we look at the physical programming of the system, we can know which one it's doing. Um, and so my position would still be the same that we could know what it's doing by looking at the programming. Right, but you'd have so to like, then know which program I was implementing, and you can't know that by looking at <laughs> what it does. <laughs> right, right. So, you so you, I agree that if you knew the program, then the puzzle would be solved. The whole puzzle is how do you know which program it's following? All right. So the first thing I would, I agree with the part that we can't know which program it's doing just by looking at the output. That part I agree with that, but that one's easy. Um, the part I disagree with is the part where you, there's nothing about the system that you could know which program it's doing. That's the part I disagree with. I think that there is, the program is there. The program is by definition in the system. So there is something about the system that we can look at to know which program it's using. Well, that's question um, begging. So the program, so it's not clear that the program is there. <laughs> What's there is some stuff internal to it that makes it act in a certain way. And then you want to interpret that in, in one way and the skeptic wants to interpret it in a different way. And the question is, what reason is there for interpreting it one way versus the other? So it's not, you can't just start with, we know what the program is. The question is, 
what is the program? Which, what is it doing? Well, that seems to be the second part of the argument. The first part of the argument is, is there anything about the object that we can know which rule it's following? And the second one is, um, how can we know that thing, whatever it is? First part, it has physical limitations. So we know from its physical limitations what it's going to do. And then if you include its its physical death or something, that doesn't that to me it seems incomprehensible to the question. But you can, and you'd still know which language it's using. So if you include that in, you know which one it's doing. It's doing quotation because it's, it's the death but, death but how? Or Well, if you take the programming, the programming in this case is including the death and the the switches inside or whatever then you know it's doing death quadition or something because that's the programming the programming is just all of those things if you include death in the programming you know the programming you know which one it's doing um so how do you know which program the system is implementing that's the quite i don't understand how you claim to know so if we're saying whatever things constitute the programming whether it's just the pcb or the pcb plus physical death we can know what's pcb by the way i must have missed that printed circuit board like just the binary ones and oh ones. okay yeah yeah sorry sorry um yeah, yeah. so i'm just including the pcb stuff if we just look at the pcb stuff it's doing addition if we're looking wait hold on PCB uh, plus... uh, 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 hold on hold on how do you get that because <laughs> it's in the programming that this continues on forever it's one of the one of the rules that's been in where the in the circuit board does it say forever um there's a specific way to write that in binary i don't know i don't know enough there is an answer to that question in programming that they can do that uh -huh. literally says continues on forever but um, how do you know that that thing which is written down in binary doesn't mean continue like this until tuesday uh because it's not physically the physical system makes it go on forever Physical, the physical, but it doesn't because it will break down at some point. So it does not go on forever. It might break down on a Tuesday, let's say. So, like, how would I phrase this? It's if the system never broke down, the way that the orientation of these ones and zeros is set is so that this pattern will not stop. It's literally programmed do not stop. It's one of the 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 principles that's built into this physical system. So it will continue on forever. That's that's the point of the program. Um, but how do you then, know that? You keep saying that, but I don't know how you what? know that. <laughs> because somebody intended to put to make it that way. No, it's like physically the system does just works that way. It's like how the orientation of the ones and zeros and the switches are set is such that it will not stop. It's like a circle. When, when will the circle stop? When will the electricity stop going in a circle? And it won't. It won't stop. Going. It won't. You get enough. You just keep going. But it will stop. And it does stop. Well, so there's it can stop for reasons like internal to the PCB, like the switches, or it can stop for reasons external to the PCB, like heat death or volcanoes or whatever, or they're hammers. And so if we're looking at the programming, I would say the only relevant factors are the ones inside the PCB. What are the switches telling us to do? And saying that there's some external switch, like a hammer or physical death or whatever, I think I would not count that as a part of the program. I would say that's not rationally considered part of the program so if we look at the pcb and just look at the switches we know what it's going to do we know which language is following and then if we include the external stuff we also know what language is following it's going to be the other one and so you can either way know which language is following by looking at the programming it's just what parts you count as the programming the right. pcb which yeah. is what I, I would i would only rationally count that or this extra stuff of the biological death or death of the object. Right, so why do you get to only count one as opposed to the other? Um, so I, to me, it seems like the word, what we're asking is, um, when we ask, is there something within the object that determines what it's doing? We're looking at the things within the objects, not the externalities to the object, which would, be its death. I would put that in one of the externalities of the actual. So if we're saying what is the what rules are the object following, I would the way I interpret that statement would mean only things rationally limited to the internal functioning of it, not the externalities. But that might be 
So first of all, this is not the halting problem as people keep for some reason confusing the two things. They are completely different. Um, so the, the question here uh, <clears throat> is how do you know what those ones and zeros really mean? What, what do they mean? Um, so there's ones and zeros there, everyone knows. But what do they mean? Um, you interpret them as one way. The skeptic interprets them in another way. Now, it's not the halting problem. People are very confused about this. Um, <clears throat> so how do you get to pick? <laughs> so you're saying within the community of people called all pro mean this. So that's the skeptical solution. Within the community, we expect one thing and not the other. But absent that, and appealing to the person who intended to put a certain program into the system and have it do a certain thing, how do you solve that problem? Well, because so I'm ignoring no, no one knows who everybody. designed your brain, so we can't we can't ask them. Right. So I'm ignoring the programmer. I don't care what the programmers intended. They don't matter to me. All I care about is the physical system of the PC. <laughs> the circuit board if you have a circle where the electricity goes in a circle and there's no off route all little like a, a stop which is what a stop would be is like where the electricity leaves the circle and it stops the system if it's just a circle and there's no off route it's continue forever because that's just what the circle means it's physically the physical consequences of the circle with no off route for the electricity if it has an off route you know you're doing off route quadition if it has no off route you're doing no off route audition. And so we can say by looking at the physical system, if there is a exception clause, which is the off route, and if there's no exception clause, there's no off route. And then you're including this externality as an off route, as an alternative off route, or it just breaks or something. Yes. To me, that does, seems to be outside of the bounds of the question, because the question is, is what is there anything inside of this object about this object? that we could know what rule it's following. And if we look at the orientation of the electrical electrodes in the PCB, it's doing this one. You can answer the question. Now for it to be doing a different one, you have to look outside of those, those things to a different thing. So we know that the PCB is following rule addition. And then if you include PCB plus physics destroys it, then only then can you say it could be doing quite issue. But if you're just looking at the PCB in the way the electricity works, there's only one interpretation. It has a circle. It has no off route. It's doing addition. Right. I mean, so you, d you gave Kripke's argument. Exactly. So you can't pick between the two. There, Wait, everything in the clear. system's history is compatible with both. <laughs> So if you just if you define it in one way, then it is doing it. If you define it in a different way, then it is doing it, isn't doing it. Well, what's the right way to define it? There's two ways. Arbitrarily saying this is the definition I prefer doesn't. Uh, I mean, it just says, yeah, I don't, you know. I pick this one, but it doesn't tell you why you get to pick that one or how it is that you're justified in assuming that you should be going on forever or anything like that. It doesn't really answer the question. It just says, so you can stipulate. Yeah. And I think that's the way we do programming. We stipulate that what we mean. That's why calculators count as doing addition because the designer intended for that to be capturing some part of addition. But if the designer had intended something different, then it would be not doing that. It'd be doing quotation. So it comes down to who built it and, and what do they have in mind? Um, you can't just look at the circuit board and know. That's the part that still just is incomprehensible to me. Because to me, like, if we're asking the question, is there something within the object to know what language it's following? That seems like that question is only relevant to the things the object has control over. It does not have control over its death. It doesn't have control. It has control over the little switches inside. It can switch, change the switches whenever it wants. And so when we're asking what language is that following, we're only asking about the switches. We're not asking about any of the other things that doesn't have control over its death, uh, volcanoes. We're hammers. asking about the designer. I mean, the thing has to well, be no, built, I don't think right? so. I don't 
Yeah. I, I think the designer is relevant. I couldn't care less about the designer. I want to know what the physical consequences of the object are. And so whether the designer intended it or not, I don't, I couldn't care less. What I, so when I'm asking the question, what rule is the object following? I'm asking what are the physical results of what it's doing? I couldn't care less about the designer. I don't, I don't, that doesn't. Right. That doesn't but that's the problem is that the physical results that it's doing are compatible with these two different interpretations. That's the part I disagree with. So if we're looking at the PCB, just the parts that it can control, it's only compatible with addition because it has a circle. There's no off switch. There's no, there's no exit ramp. There's no exception clause. It's only once you leave this and add the other stuff, which I don't think is a part of the question that you can get the quotation. Well, so it is part of the at, question because the question is how do you know that you get to leave that stuff off? To me, that's like in the definition of what rule is this object following? that seems to imply that it's only the things under which the object is in control of like to say that i'm but why i mean that's that's part it's I don't like understand. it's like the hammer the hammer thing you granted that someone coming by and smashing it with a hammer isn't a part of the rule it's following and so right. if there's an externality a thing it has no control over to which it causes a different pattern the object wasn't following this alternative pattern the object plus the externality you could say was following this alternative pattern, but the object was not following this external pattern. Um, and so when we look at the object, we know it's doing addition, but then if we look at the object plus the externality, that system could be doing quadition and that system could have been designed by designer Bob or whatever, but the object was doing addition. It was doing addition correctly. And then the externality came in and smashed it. And so, to me, the answer is either way, we can know which system it's following. The object is doing addition. The object plus the hammer is doing quadition. And maybe that system was designed by Bob, but I don't care because either way, we can still know what, what language is or what rule it's following by looking at the programming. Um, suppose I'm an alien from Alpha Centauri and I build this device and the device is a calculator for quadition. And that's what I intend for it to do. And what I want this thing to do is to add numbers up to 100,000 and then return an E to signify that the quadition result, because it's always five. So, yeah. so you don't really have to have it say five. You can just know that, okay, so this is in the five domain. So I build it that way, intending that this is what it's supposed to be doing. I then ship it to earth and you find it and you say this thing is adding and i come to earth and say no i'm wrong wait, wait was the say that again you're wrong yeah am i wrong because it doesn't seem like i am I being the person with the calculator, or I being the alien from Alpha Centauri. Who are we, who are so, we talking about? Suppose I, I ship the calculator. I address it to Tom Jump, care of Church of the Everlasting Help Everyone. What is your church again? I forget. Uh, church the of the Best, best Possible, possible Worlds. World. <laughs> yes, exactly. The Best Possible World is one where they do addition, obviously. So I ship it to you. You open it up. You look at this calculator and you start putting numbers in it and you get all the numbers you expect, except for at some point it returns an E. Then you say, this thing is doing addition. I looked inside of it. I see what it's doing. Um, and then I, the alien, come to Earth. And I come to your house and I say, did you get my quadition present? And you say, what? No, this is doing addition. And then I explain to you how I designed it. Am I incorrect? So I would say if we look at the programming, we could tell who is correct and who is not correct. So like if it's quadition, then at some point it will change to the exception clause, which would be the E. So yes, you're right. You're doing it. It's doing quadition. If there is no exception clause and the object just breaks, I would say I'm right. It's doing addition. And so there's an externality there that is outside of the object. So we're asking about the object itself. What is the object doing? If the object was programmed to just send an E back and the object is doing quadition, if the object does math and then breaks, I'd say it's doing 
audition, not quadition. So if it's internal to the object, what is the object doing? The object is doing what it's programming is telling it to do. And if it's give back E, it's doing quadition. If it's if it just keeps going till it breaks, I'd say it's doing audition. Okay. So you agree though that the intention of the designer matters. No. I'd say well, only... suppose I'm a different alien now and I built the same device, but I intended it for to do addition. And then I come to Earth and tell you, I designed this to do addition, but large numbers, no one ever gets that high. So I just didn't program that part in. I'd you say, say I'm doing, wrong? It's doing quad. Yes, I'd say you're wrong. It's doing quadition. You programmed it in such a way that after a certain large number, it returns an error value. It's doing quadition. Um, and if you programmed it to just keep going till it breaks, I'd say it is doing addition, correctly doing addition. Um, huh. Okay. So that's a strange way. I mean, I'm surprised by that result, but, but okay. So, uh, I, the designer could be wrong about the thing I designed. What function? Absolutely. That happens all the time. It happens all the time. Okay. So our current designers could be wrong about what function they're implementing. Sure. Okay. So then there's no way to know. <laughs> well, I'd say, you know, by what the, if you look at the program and calculate the consequences, you know what it was doing. So I don't, whether the designer intended it that way or not, I don't think it's ever, is ever relevant. I don't think it's ever relevant what the designer intended. I think that the programming of the object and the consequences that that will entail, no, will tell you what it's doing every time, always. Interesting. Um, so you don't think that there's any, so the alien from Alpha and Centauri just couldn't build a system that worked in the way that I'm talking about, according to you. No, I think, like, you, could. I, so I I think just, you could You could build a system that does quadition where uh, it has an exception clause that once it gets to this point, do E. And then that would be... But what about if the like exception the, clause is once it gets to this point, short circuit? That's the part I don't think that would not count. That part would be uh, it's doing audition. And when it breaks, that's the externality. So I think when you have the externalities, you're not asking what is the object doing. You're asking what the what is the object plus the externality doing? It's a different system. So if the original question is, is, is there something within the object to know which system it's doing? The answer is what the PCB is printed to do. And if there's, and so we answer the question, yes. And then if you're asking what is the, the object plus the externality, that's a different question. You can still get the same answer. Yes, you just look at the programming which of this the whole system, but that's different than asking about the object in and of itself, because you're asking about the object plus this externality of the breaking. And so for me, I would still say, yes, we can look at the programming. And even if we include this externality thing, you could still look at the programming. It's just whether or not it's, it's a part of the object, uh, as in it's not a part of how it was designed. I mean, literally a physical part of the functioning object versus external to the functioning object. What counts as external? Something that's not on the PCB. Um, yeah, something that the PCB doesn't control. Uh-huh. In what sense of control are we invoking here? Um, so, uh, like when I, when I control my thoughts or whatever, I don't have control over my aging process. It's not something I can manipulate, turn on and off repeatedly whenever I want. Mm -hmm. So I would say control is that thing, things that it can change back and forth whenever it wants kind of a thing. Uh -huh. So flipping the zeros to ones and ones to zeros. Yes. But okay. breaking implies that you can't change it back means right. it's done and so yes. then that's outside of your control you, you've lost control over this function you're broken and so i would say things you can control are things that are uh, manipulatable manual manipulation broken is things you can't control it's, it, you've lost control and you just think for some reason it's impossible to use those i mean the, the basic idea which i'm trying to press you on is that we 
harness elements of the physical world in order to make them compute. Electrons don't compute on their own. States of electricity don't compute on their own. We harness those features of the world. Um, we don't depend which need... philosopher you ask. Oh yeah, which ones should I ask? That would deny this. The computability things that just everything is computation. I'm sure I've read that somewhere. Oh, I see what you mean. Um, well, I was talking about things we make. Yeah. So if, if yeah. the laws of physics are implementing computations and um, they still are harnessing physical things to implement computations, you, you would say. Um, and it's conceivable that those could have been implemented in different ways. Um, so that's good. Um, but uh, the stuff that we build harnesses stuff that we find already that's out there. And then we arrange it in certain ways so that it mirrors or abstractly relates to this, you know, uh, state transition space that we're interested in. Um, so which things we use seems completely arbitrary. This is the point I was trying to make earlier. It seems like anything that's out there in the external world can be harnessed in a way to perform computations. Like which things out there aren't that way? Well, so far as we can tell, there aren't any. Um, Turing machines can be implemented by any kind of system, physical or otherwise. The only thing that matters, uh, well, maybe, you know, real Turing machines can't because they specify infinite tape and nothing like that is real. So I don't know, there might be some issues here, but um, uh, any sort of system that's built by us harnesses some physical thing and then makes it behave in a certain way as according to the way the computation is supposed to go. Right? You agree with that? Yep. Yep. Okay. So why are you then limiting yourself to some arbitrary subset of the things that we can harness, which are whatever controllable things are inside of the system? It seems like a clever designer could harness any physical property. That's the kind of point. Even ones that we think of as anomalous or malfunctioning could be harnessed by a clever enough designer. So you seem to be arbitrarily ruling that out. No, so I agree. I agree with that. But if we're asking, the question is, is, is there anything in the object? So it depends what we classify as the object. So if we classify the object as the internal structure of the PCB, it's doing addition. Now the designer could have included this externality of an external a physical decay or whatever, but that would be a different system. We're not asking about the object of the PCB, we're asking about the object of the PCB plus externality. Either way, you can still answer the question. You can still know which system it's doing by looking at the programming. So if we include the death of the, the PCB or the death of the biological unit, that system, we can know which one it's doing by looking at the programming. It's doing quadition because it's gonna die or whatever. Um, and so either way we answer the question, yes. Uh, and so from like, if you were saying which one is right, which one is the correct interpretation, they're both correct. They're both correct interpretations because the object refers to either the singular PCB or the PCB plus the externality. And so yeah. either way we can know which system it's following. And either way, the answer is only correct for one of them based off of which system you're looking at, the, the individual or the collective. And now if you want to have an, ask a meta question is which one is the, the the preferred interpretation? I don't think that part is relevant. I don't think that part is meaningful because it's correct either way. Like the, the PCB is doing addition, the PCB plus the hammer is doing quadition. Those statements are both correct. Right, so how come you haven't just admitted that the skeptic is right? Because the question is, is there anything that you could look at, at the internal states of the system, which would distinguish between these two things? And you just said, no, because the whole question is about what's inside your head. And there are these two different programs, one which is involving these externalities, which you're ruling out, and the other one which doesn't. And both of them are compatible with every state inside the system. I think that's the part I'm disagreeing with because inside the system seems to refer to just the internal components of the PCB and not the externalities. That seems to be yes, a requirement. Right. 
And yeah. if we don't include the externality, we can look at the PCB and say, this is the one that's doing it. Why? Um, because the physical... Doing that. It, so, so remember, there's two options. One is it's designed to do this and it accidentally breaks down at some point in the future. The other interpretation is it's designed to do this and break down at some point in the future. So on one interpretation, you have all the internal states plus an accidental malfunction. And on the other interpretation, you have all of the internal states plus a designed malfunction. And so the question is, which one? So looking at the internal states doesn't tell you. Well, to me, they're both the same. They're both doing addition either way. The yeah, breakdown. What, what? That's weird. The breakdown seems to be an externality that's outside of the system. So if we're asking the question, if we look in the system, can we determine which program it's doing? In the system seems to be incompatible with it breaking down because that's the control thing I mentioned earlier. Like mm -hmm. in the system is only the things it controls. If it breaks down, it no longer has control. So it's not in the system. That would be my intuitive understanding of in the system, what we mean by in the system. And so breaks down seems to be incompatible with in the system. Right, it is. The point though, is that all the stuff in the system is compatible with these two different programs. One where the externality is a malfunction and the other where the externality is not a malfunction. The, the stuff the system is doing doesn't tell you what those two interpretations is right. That's the well, to me, it seems in both the system is doing addition. Both of them, the system is doing addition. There is no quadition. Um, when it breaks down, the system has lost control. It's doing nothing. So in both, it is 100% doing addition all the way up until it breaks, and then it's doing nothing in both cases. But I, the but designer, I say I designed it to break down at exactly this point. <laughs> I mean, that's like you saying that my key lock thing doesn't wasn't designed to open the door. I just I did design it that way. I designed it to short circuit and therefore open the door. Or alternatively, I could have designed it so that the door only opens after the keys on the keypad wear down enough. And you would say, gee, that's weird, but that's how I designed it. So the code is really just the right password is wait and punch all the numbers until the key codes wore down. That could be something that I built the system to do. So, so again, from my perspective, I don't think the designer has any relevance at all. I don't think they have any say. I think it's all the physical. Yeah, but, but the argument is supposed to be exactly for the claim that the designer has all the say. That's the whole point. So, I mean, you can't just look at the system and say, absent the intention of the designer, what it's doing. Why not? Because it's compatible with the designer intending that this thing work like this and then it broke accidentally and also compatible with the designer intending that it work like this and break down at a certain point as a way of doing what it wants so in both cases you have the same thing you have the system doing stuff until it breaks down and in one case that was an accident we say it malfunctioned and in the other case we say that's exactly what it was supposed to do and the internal states of the systems are the same so I would say in both cases, it's just do that is one rule. There is only one rule and that is it goes until it breaks down or whatever. It's, and there is no intention of the designer me making it into a separate possible rule there. So I'd say that- But then you're just the saying that I can't build a device like this, which I, I mean, I could. I mean, if I, why, why, why couldn't I build a device like this? Well, sure, sure you could build a device like that. I don't, whether you could build it is- separate from what is the rule that it's following. So you could build a device with whatever, whatever intention you wanted, but the rule that the object is following is going to be determined by its physical consequences of what happens to it or whatever. And exactly. so- Exactly, and it breaks down at a certain point, which is one of the physical sure. consequences. Sure, but there's only one rule there. The only In both cases, the only option rule is object goes until it breaks down or something. Um, what you intended for it, whether you intended it to have it or not, or whether you intended it to not break down, makes no difference. Your intentions are completely irrelevant. The rule the object is following, it goes until it breaks down. Um, and so I, I think no matter what the rule is, you can know what rule it's following by saying the physical consequences of what happens to the object. 
And I think that'll always answer the question, what rule is it following? Right, but why isn't that just begging the question? Because if I am the designer and I build this system to implement a certain rule by breaking down, then that's how I built it. And it's working correctly when it does that. And you're saying, no, it's not. And that I'm wrong. I can't build a system like that because it would be some other function, which I didn't intend, even though I know all the details about how it functions, when it's going to break down. And I use that as a part of my design. I would say that the, the laws of physics essentially are the ultimate determinant of the rule and your intended rules are irrelevant. So the reason you can't have a different rule is whatever the physical consequences of the system are, that's the rule. And you can describe it in a different way if you want, but the rule is the physical consequences of the system. And so, but these are physical consequences of the system. And I know that as a designer. Sure. So in my lock case, if I build it so that you put down, <laughs> it was to put in the correct code and it malfunctions, then it's not malfunctioning. It's doing exactly what it's supposed to do. So someone who came along and said, this lock is broken would be wrong. They just would be mistaken. That's exactly how I built it. They would say, gee, this lock is weird. You put in a code and it's short circuited. Uh, it's broken. It just accidentally opened the door. And then I would come along and say, no, I built it that way. That's what I wanted it to do. So it seems like you can't say I'm wrong about that. That's how I built it. Right, right. So that's fine. But if you're saying, is the lock following a rule or whatever? And we look at the lock, it's internal functioning. Does its internal functioning follow this rule? The answer would be no. It's only the internal functioning plus this physical limitation that causes it to break that's following this rule. So that would be the externality. So is the lock right. following this rule? No. Is the lock plus the breaking following the rule? Yes. Either way, we can look at the system and know which rule it's following by the physical consequences of the system. And so I mean, I can say you yeah. designed the lock plus the breaking to function this way. Happy to grant that. Is the lock following the rule? No. The lock plus the breaking is following the rule. Um, and so either way, it still seems like we can look at the system and look at the programming to know what it's doing. But and you would then, be wrong if you just looked at the program. The question is what the word, is it breaking down? Is that really the correct description of the system? Um, and you can't know that without knowing how I designed it. Well, I, again, I would say breaking down is whether it loses control over something. If it loses control over something, it's broken. Yeah, but if I designed it, it didn't lose control. It, it would, did what it's supposed to do. Well, it still can't undo it, so it'd still be broken in that kind of context. Um, a lock that works just one, a, f a function that's performed one time is still a good performance of that function. I mean, so if you set up dominoes and they knock them over, it can, you know, that just happened one time. Maybe you can't repeat it, but at that point you can't come along and say, oh, that's not what it's supposed to do or something. The question is, is it doing what it's supposed to do? And in this case, the answer is yes, because I built it that way. The supposed to do part, I'm not, I'm not following. Because if we want to know what rule it's following, who cares what it's supposed to do, which was what it's well, going that's, to do. Oh, um, yeah. So saying what rule it's following is, is is bound up with saying what it's supposed to be doing. Is it malfunctioning or is it functioning correctly? That's why, why would those be bound up. Well, because in the two cases, in the one case, you say this thing is performing function X and it is not working correctly at this time T. And in the other case, you're saying this system is performing function Y by correctly breaking down at time T. So uh, the whole question is whether it's a design, it's uh, functioning as it's supposed to when it's doing what you call malfunctioning because the clever designer isn't, it's not a malfunction. It's doing exactly what it was designed to do. It's working it correctly um, by breaking down, uh, you would, by doing something that you would consider to be breaking down. 
So that's the question is, is it functioning correctly? Is it doing what it's supposed to be doing? And you look at it and go, no, it's totally broken. And I look at it and go, no, it's doing exactly what it's supposed to be doing. So which, the meaning, the meaning part, which, when you ask which rule the object is following, um, yeah. why can't we say object A on its own, the prior to the breaking is following one rule, and then when it's, break, when it's broken, it's following a different rule? Well, because if I, the designer, um, would come along and say, you're incorrect. <laughs> I designed it to be following this rule, which is, um, you know, work like this until the correct code is put in and then malfunction. Uh, I mean, quote, quote, malfunction. It's not really malfunctioning, but, you know, short circuit or whatever. Take advantage of some physical property that the system has, which I'm clever enough to exploit. The, the point that I was trying to raise earlier is that all of this stuff that we use to compute are just exploiting physical things in the environment malfunctioning is a thing in the environment which we could exploit to implement functions um so that the past behavior of the system is compatible with either of these interpretations and there's nothing inside the system you could point to which would tell you which one was correct which you seem to already admit you said if you just look at the system itself you don't know whether it's doing this correctly or that incorrectly which is the whole skeptical challenge were you in the past adding correctly or were you in the past um, using quadition incorrectly when you gave certain answers to certain questions? So the, the whole question has been, is the system working right or is the system not working right? Right. And I'm still on the perspective of who gets to define what's right. So like if the system is trying to do something, like if I'm trying to add and I had one plus one equals two or whatever, and I have no exclusion clause, I'm doing addition. It seems like that, that question is, is solved. Like the one who determines whether or not you're doing addition correctly is you, your brain. What are the principles in your brain? You determine that no one else gets to say. And yeah. for an object, I would say the same thing is true. The object, um, how it functions without breaking is, the same as you doing addition with your principles. When you're breaking, it seems like you're not doing the rule anymore because when you're trying to do the rule, you're trying to do the whatever your brain is programmed to do without breaking. If you're breaking, yeah. you're not doing the rule. So to me, it seems like how we would determine who is correct is based off of the object itself and the things within the object without it breaking. And that determines the correct answer. The adding the breaking part seems to be incorrect. Seems to be incorrect. That, that's it. question begging though, because that the whole issue is which of these is the correct way to describe the system. So which rule is being implemented? So you say if there is no exclusion um, principle, written down inside the language of the system, then it's doing addition. Whereas I, the designer, say, look, I'm not gonna write down the rules. I'm gonna build it into the hardware that it follows this rule by having it break down at a certain point. So I'm gonna build the rule in, into the physical functioning of the system, sort of like, like you know, um, a card or something like that, where you build the system itself to implement a, a certain program without writing the rule down. It's the way the thing is structured that causes, that is the following of the rule. So here also could be a clever way to have the rule implemented, the exclusion rule, the, the, the uh, um, you know, the exception, sorry, not exclusion, the exception rule. Um, uh, one way to do it is write down the sentence. If the number is greater than 55, then return the answer five. Another way to build that very same rule into the system is have it short circuit as when you enter those numbers. Then and you have the same thing. So it's just sure, a but... clever way of implementing this rule. So you can't tell by looking at the system malfunctioning, whether it was performing addition correctly and malfunctioning now, or whether it was performing quadition and working right right now. 
Sure. But if we bring that back into the perspective of like a human, say I'm doing addition, but I've been programmed to die once I get to 37 or whatever, I don't want to die. I'm doing addition, not quad addition, because I don't want to die. But the programmer has designed me to die once I get to 37. So I'm doing quad addition or whatever. I would say, no, that person is doing addition. And then the designer made a system where that person plus their death is doing quad addition. And so from the perspective of the individual doing the numbers, what are they doing? They're doing addition. So, <laughs> I mean, we have been circling around this point for a long time, but um, why are you justified in thinking that you're doing addition? I don't see why you get to say that. So you, you don't know what the intention of the designer was. I mean, that's the whole kind of point of this argument is that either you say, look, I live in a community and the community expects a certain answer. They expect me to say 125 when I add 57 plus whatever, 60 some. So they expect that. Um, so therefore I'm correct when I say it because the community expects me to continue on in a certain way. Uh, <clears throat> so, okay, but X, but, but regard, but factoring out that the community expects me to continue on in a certain way, then it's just kind of by stipulation that you say, this couldn't have been built in the following way. Well, it's not that they couldn't be built. It's more like if the designer's goals usurp the, the goals of the object, um, I think that if we're asking the question, what is the object doing? The object gets priority. So if I'm, if I'm the object and I'm doing addition and says, and says never stop. And the designer said, I'm going to die and it stops. If the question is, is what is the object doing? It seems I take priority. My intentions take priority. And so I get to determine I'm doing addition. Because I have this principle that says never stop. It's in my brain. I'm doing this. And even if I was designed to break down by some other thing, what am I doing? I'm doing addition. So you get to determine which function you're implementing, even though you might have been designed to implement a different function? Uh, yes. But that seems a bit like, <laughs> I mean, I don't understand how you get to say that. Because what you're just saying is, you know, um, no matter how you built me, I'm still working incorrectly when this happens. Yeah. So like if I have an intention of doing math that goes on forever, but my designer has an intention that I die after 37 or something. And the question is, is what am I doing? The it's a question of ownership, I guess, who, who owns the I and, and so I, I would say the ownership is of the conscious individual in that case. So the, individual determines what they're doing and then you yeah. can say um the individual is doing addition but the system the individual plus the death which was controlled by the designer was doing quad addition and so the individual was doing addition but why do you get to make that distinction it just seems like the context of when we ask what is the object doing the object seems to be the the priority or the the significant factor in there and not the designer. So we're asking like, what does the, what did the designer make the system to do or something? That's a separate question than what is the object doing? The object being the significant thing, the determining factor of what it's doing is takes priority. When you just ask the question that way, what is the object doing? Right. Versus if you ask the question, um, what did the designer make the system to do something? And well, so it seems like, I mean, the, the, the link between the two, the link is the, between the two is supposed to be that what the system is doing is what the designer intended it to do. And I think that's that so. If they be, intend X, then it's doing X correctly. If they intend Y, then it's doing Y incorrectly. And I think that may be the one of the key distinctions because I think when we ask what is the object doing, we ignore the designer entirely. It's just the way the question is phrased seems to me to be focusing on what the object objects intentions are i guess rather than the designer's intentions and if we phrase the question differently then we could prioritize the designer's intentions and so i think maybe that's why 
the rule following it doesn't make as much sense to me because when you ask the question, what is the object doing? To me, the object as an as an entity takes priority over anything the designers. I think designers are just irrelevant. Or anything. Yeah. But the object, see, you, you're defining what the object is. You're saying the that's sort of what you already admitted. I thought that the object just is the internal states of the object. Um, but the but the whole question is what about the internal states tells you one one way or the other. So you say I'm intending to do addition. Then the skeptic says, "Are you sure you haven't been intending to do addition, which is intending to do addition up until a certain number, and then intending to do quadition afterwards?" So there's a kind of way that you try to reformulate some priority of yourself. The skeptic is going to come along and say, yeah, but there's these interpretations of what you're saying that you can't rule out, like that you, you were schmintending as opposed to intending, or to schmintend, like I said, is to intend to add up to a certain number and then do quadition after that number. So given that you've never passed those numbers, you don't know whether you've been intending or schmintending. I mean, that's the, the every word that you pick, the skeptic is going to play the same game. Right. Because okay, it's, so... remember, it's all semantics. It's about what do the concepts mean? What do the words mean? And are you actually aligning yourself with the right ones or making a mistake? Um, the, the central question is always, are you adding correctly or doing quadding incorrectly? Um, are you doing quadition correctly or addition incorrectly? And which one of those you say um, seems to depend on how the thing was built. And you don't have to like forget, you know, this isn't necessarily an argument for God. Um, by the way, in our previous discussion, I was never meaning to, uh, I don't believe in God, obviously, but I wasn't ever trying to suggest an argument for the existence of God. I was trying to suggest that this is, you know, something that the precepts um, can kind of get you with because uh, you have to kind of presuppose a bunch of stuff, what you're doing, by the way. Um, so without all those presuppositions, I'm zero presuppositions, zero presuppositions. But you just did make a presupposition <laughs> that it's the person that they get to have priority. Um, whereas the skeptic comes along and says, it's challenging your priority uh, and saying, how do you know um, that uh, you have been doing intending versus smintending, that you've been doing addition versus quadition or, or any of these things? And there's nothing in your past history which really tells us the answer to that question so that so the past history of the person everything internal to you is compatible with it being designed in one way but also in a different way which i thought you already said um, yeah so i agree with i thought you agreed matrix. with me so I, that's why i'm i'm confused because it seems like you keep agreeing with the argument but then saying i'm not agreeing with the argument because you basically say uh, don't call me Dark Dawkins, dude. What the fuck, dude? Um, that dumbass can eat a dick. Uh, that's not me. Um, this is a serious argument. Um, Kripke's a serious person. He's a he's a genius. You may think word games are not fun, but this is a question about how meaning and rule following are related to each other. And while no one is convinced of this argument, uh, I've never met someone, by the way who um, says, yes, I'm a meaning skeptic <laughs> and I'm convinced by Kripke's argument. I've never met that person, but I've also, not even Kripke, <laughs> Kripke himself up to the day he died, I was in his class uh, pretty much up to that point. He says, uh, I don't know what, but there's gotta be something. But the, the one thing that I do, I am convinced of is that while everyone is unconvinced of the argument, no one has pointed out a convincing response. Right. And so, so, my, so that's that's really what I'm pressing. I mean, obviously, we all want it to be wrong, but it's like, where in the argument do you get out? And and I see what you're saying as kind of giving into the argument. Well, I'm saying all language and meaning uh, are determined by something more primitive, physics. It's determined by physics. And intentions are also determined by physics. So if the designer that has intention, that's determined by physics. So it's all physics. I think that all of meaning comes down to physics. Yeah. And so I think we can look at the system and know what it's doing by the physics. And I think the problem is more how to communicate that effectively in relation to the arguments. Cause I don't, I don't, I still don't see a problem with understanding that. Can we know what rule 
uh, a thing is following, yeah, it's, it's doing whatever its physical parts are making it do. That's that's the answer. And right, some abstract that's rule it, that's, that's been <laughs> placed on that is is a separate thing. It's just it's it's not following this abstract rule that we place on it. It's following the physical constituents of its parts and the abstract rules are just there is there is no such thing it's the physical parts are the meaning but the physical parts leave open these two interpretations so they can't be the meaning is the argument that just That's looking the at the physical parts leaves open whether it's functioning correctly or incorrecting at least at a certain point and that's the part I just I disagree with. I think that's can we interpret the actual meaning in multiple ways? Yes. Does that mean the actual meaning is incorrect? No. That's the way. Right. I but what in the system makes that true? I say there's nothing parts of in the, the system. system which rules out what I'm saying or what the Kripkean argument is. And by the way, just because no one agrees with this doesn't mean it's sophistry. I mean, Hume is a skeptic. <laughs> Um, he's not a sophist. Uh, the, there's the, the puzzle is a challenge. Um, the fact that no one is convinced just means that they don't have a good answer. I mean, you could say, I don't know why, but it's got to be, but that's not really a good answer. So what we're looking for is a good answer. One that says, yes, in fact, these states in the system rule out and make that over there a malfunction. Um, but it doesn't seem like that you can find anything like that. How how this be from different from saying um, whether or not we're in the matrix? There is a fact of the matter whether or not we're in the matrix. We just have to know what the rules of the system are, whatever the fundamental nature of reality is. We we answer the question. Why would that same thing not work here? Which rule does it follow? If we know all of the facts of reality, there is an answer there. Yes, including how it was built and whether. Um, it's doing what it was built the right way. So if you knew that, then you would have an answer. Well, presumably there isn't. So that, that has no. to bring in the intention of the designer. Otherwise you can't answer that question. Well, the designer was built by physics, presumably. So the designer is just a result of physics. And so the designer doesn't seem to be the base thing we're looking for. It seems like there's something more prior to the designer that we would look at to know the physical rules that it's following. And that's well, we'd want to know. I mean, it, it depends on whether you agree that the question is whether it's working correctly or not. Because, uh, um, yeah, the correctly part I don't think I've ever really, yeah, the correctly part I don't think I've ever really thought about as much. It's more like, can we know what rule the object is following correctly? Uh, yeah, I don't think the correctly part fits into my worldview. It's like whether it's doing it correctly. Like because it has be doing, to why? Because you could you could be because doing otherwise that. you can't say what it's doing. You can't so um oh, by the way I won't stop looking at the chat because I'm interested in what people who are intelligent and informed have to say. So far certain people in the chat are not meeting that standard and other people are and I'm very interested in what they have to say. Um, so that's not going to stop. However, the question here is in a given case where the system seems to be malfunctioning, is it in fact malfunctioning? That's the question. So you cannot really do this without answering the question. Is it working correctly at this time when it seemingly breaks down? So what comes to mind that's is like, uh, if I'm doing addition and I, keep going past 50, 50 to keep 56, 57, whatever, and don't go back to five. I'm doing addition correctly and quadition incorrectly, but which one I'm doing seems to be determined based off of my intent. So if I want to communicate addition to you, I'm doing addition correctly. Even though, even if my designer designed me to do quadition, he doesn't matter. Who cares? What matters is, is what I'm intending to communicate. Well, because the reason why we're supposed to care is because at a certain time where you think the thing is breaking down, the designer might have made it work that way on purpose. So it's not breaking down. That's the whole 
that's kind of the crux of the entire issue is are the things which you would point and say this is a mistake are they mistakes or not well so that seems like a different question because i was always, always focused on the question is there something about it we can tell which rule it's following yes and that seems like a different question than is it doing one correctly which correct which is the correct rule but the reason why they're they're not separate questions uh, is that this breakdown case has to be interpreted as a mistake or not a mistake so it's either part of the design of the system and doing what it's supposed to be doing or it's not part of the design of the system and at this point it's not what doing what it's supposed to be doing so the question is, when the system breaks down, is it working correctly? So that's how they get in. So because someone could have built it that way so that it actually <laughs> is supposed to break down at that point and therefore working correctly at that point. To be fair to the chat, that does sound very much like the halting problem. Why? Because you're asking when the system stops. The halting problem is whether you could formally prove that the system ever stops. That's yeah. not what we're talking about. I'm not talking about formally well, how, proving anything. Well, so this, like that's did the a completely system, different question. It's confused to make that statement. Did did the system stop or did it break? Is it still going? Is it just still going? That's a part of the system. That's when it when it answers. The question is whether the stopping, the breaking down part. Um, by the way. The uh, the halting problem doesn't have to do with anything with the thing breaking. It has to do whether there's an entailment of the program that it stops. That's a different question. The part, well, the question that we're asking here you're is, you're saying that the breaking was a part of the program, right? I'm saying it's compatible with it breaking that it was part of the program. That would be the same as the halting problem continuing in that case, right? The stopping was a part of the program in that case. The halting problem is about whether you could formally prove that any given program will halt. Yeah. The question here is what program is the system implementing? Different questions. And the problem is that a smart person can make a program being implemented by doing something that you would think of as breaking down. So that right. you say the system is broken, but it's actually doing what it's supposed to be doing. It's not broken. All right. Well, we've been going for about two and a half hours and I have to get to work pretty soon. Okay. I don't, <laughs> yeah, I don't think my position has changed. I still don't understand that part of the argument still for me it's like we look at the physical system we know its rule is falling whether or not it's programmed it or not and the breaking i would i'll count that as an externality just on how i understand the words to mean but i don't have a further way to explain that because i haven't yeah thought about well that's that just uh i mean that's just question making so you can say that but that's not a good answer to the challenge, which is what is it about the physical system that proves that it's working correctly at this time as opposed to incorrectly at this time, uh, which is the entire challenge. But that's fine. All right, well, I'll think about it more, try and think about it from the perspective of whether it's working correctly or incorrectly. Yeah, cool. All right, well, thanks for taking the time to have this conversation with me. And uh, I'll be looking forward to hearing your further thoughts. Sure. Thanks. I appreciate you coming on, and I will talk to you later. Okay.